Welcome everyone to our webinar about integrative pain management. Hi, my name is Teresa Schmidt of edusize.com. I'm going to share with you some interesting alternative and complementary ways to handle pain. I'm going to be going through a PowerPoint presentation with slides. So I'll be backing out of this section of the segment. You'll, feel, you'll hear a few minutes of quiet at the beginning as everyone logs in to the chat roll, and then we'll get started. So thank you and enjoy. Again, just take a few minutes, give us about five minutes and we'll get started with the program. Check your audio in the meantime. Looking forward to working with you this evening. You'll notice that we have a share screen going on, so you'll be able to see the screen share. And you can follow along with the slides that way. Give us about five minutes, get yourself a cup of coffee or a drink of water, and we'll get started. Tom. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening for integrative pain management. And we're going to be exploring some very in unique and interesting ways to help people who have pain. And of course, I'd just like you to think about for yourself, how many of you are experiencing pain? You may notice there is a chat roll Q&A and feel free to submit your questions. And if you miss asking any questions today. As you go through the slides, you'll see my website, edgesize.com. If you have questions after the program ends, feel free to email me and I'll be happy to respond with any resources I could provide for you. Uh, you'll see starting with the program, you have the course description. Uh, one of the biggest issues beyond the human aspect of pain is that it costs a lot of money to have pain these days, especially in this country. Uh, not, it goes well beyond the cost of what insurance companies are paying, but even what people are paying out of pocket. And then what they're paying for in loss of life quality. There's a tremendous amount of addiction in this country today and worldwide because of pain. People were so used to getting that magic pill that would make their pain disappear, and then they ended up taking more and more pills until they became addicted with all of the problems that go with that. So we're looking to see, are there more natural ways to manage pain? Are there any tips or tricks? That's exactly where we're going this evening. We're going to take a look at the biopsychosocial model of pain and see what's different about that and what's something about that that's been around for many, many years. And you'll find that many of the tips and tricks are sim simply things that were known by ancient ones years ago and forgotten and now they're coming back. But you'll see that there are learning outcomes for today. If you need any of those for your boards for later, feel free to check it out. Uh, there's a course agenda for us as well, some of the items that we'll be discussing as you move throughout the evening. And it's basically covering about three hours of time. So sit tight, and if you need to get up and stretch and move around, do so. If you need a quick break, do so. And uh, staying moving is one of the best ways to be more comfortable. Now, just interesting question. What does pain mean to you? Love to see on the chat roll. I see we have about 50 people with us this evening. And I'd like to just see some of the answers and responses and we'll be sharing those as we go. We'll have an interactive evening here. <clears throat> now, pain to me is typically something to be avoided. And that's how it is for most people. 
However, if you look at some of the uh, practices that some people do, such as the yogis, uh, they might go walking on pieces of glass or hot coals. Uh, and they think it's just fine. I know athletes who feel like no pain, no gain, you know, the more the merrier. But uh, pain can often mean a poor quality of life. Thank you, Karen, for sharing that. So get a piece of paper or make a little note on your tablet or computer there and write down right now. You can keep you active during this course, hopefully, and list three problems that you associate with pain. Now, most of you who are observing this evening are clinicians of some kind. So just to see what's out there or there. PT and PTAs, give me a shout out. OTs and OTAs. How about our massage therapists, athletic trainers? Any other professionals with us this evening? Great, I see a lots of PTs, a couple of OTs, and also more people coming in about pain is discomfort we're looking to avoid. And that's very true. Of course, I know many people who are looking to get into pain by exercising, running as hard and as fast as they can to really feel the burn. So pain doesn't necessarily have to be a negative. Pain can be something that people are actually looking for. It can be a positive, but that's an individualized issue, right? What pain means to you is very different. So Stacy's saying pain means a signal that something isn't right. Uh, problems associated with pain. Mary Beth is saying poor breathing. Any other clinical issues that you see working with patients, working with the public? What are problems that you come across? Decreased functional mobility, yes. Imbalance, okay. Decreased ADL performance. Of course, mental health issues are a very common issue with pain. Depression, yes, there are psychosocial issues as well. Depression is huge. Mobility issues, of course, we're movement pr practitioners. We're like the kings and queens of motion. So that's a huge issue for us, and that's often what we need to document. Of course, thank you, Sharon. There's that fear of movement too, yes. Many people are afraid of moving because, hey, it hurt to move last time, so I just stopped moving. Of course, that compounds things astronomically, doesn't it? Uh, sometimes compensation is an issue whether it's compensation by using different movement patterns, different activities, or compensation by looking for compensation for the pain. People feel they need to collect something for pain, and that's often very true. There's often legal ramifications for someone to be caused pain by another party of some kind. So interesting. Pain could also be a poor motivator and also create poor mood, poor thinking. Thank you for that there can make people angry as well. So getting some very interesting uh, background here on the chat roll, more sedentary lifestyle for people in pain. You know, it's so common that people with chronic pain, because of the pain associated with moving, just stop moving and become very sedentary, leading to fear avoidance issues, withdrawal from normal activities, apprehension, all of these things, absolutely. So pain is a limiting factor in many ways, and that can be good. Pain can be used for manipulation of caregivers. Ah, thank you, Jocelyn. That's something that we do come across on occasion, right? Compliance can also be an issue. Thank you, Warren. And of course, there could be an issue of isolation with pain, decreased motivation for socialization. So Sharita had that to share. Thank you so much. Warren, depression and muscle apathy. Carly has an interesting uh, way of putting that. Muscle apathy and even contractures. I think you meant atrophy. But muscle apathy is a very interesting thing, an interesting way to look at it. So let's go ahead and jump right into our program. So how many of you have come across just when someone says, oh, I feel your pain? Anyone ever get annoyed at that? <laughs> I know some patients would be telling me, yeah, someone told me they felt my pain and they have no idea what it's really about. The unique thing about pain is that when we're acting as clinicians, especially if we're looking to have insurance reimbursement documentation, how many of you can't wait to document what a great job you did with a patient, right? Everybody's like, no, no, not me. Too much tennis elbow from documenting too much. Your fingers are going to fall off from typing away. But it's a noxious stimulus, isn't it? And it's first person. So when we say, yeah, we need objective measures of things, we talk about, Oh, give me a number from zero to 10. How bad do you hurt? The pain scale, right? Well, 10 is the worst pain you can imagine. Zero, of course, is no pain. Well, that's really the person's subjective evaluation. Now, I could have two patients in my office. I have the one guy, he's in his wheelchair. He's on the, the morphine drip to control the severe pain is rheumatoid arthritis. 
and he's, you know, welcoming. He says, hi, Teresa, how are you doing today? I said, yeah, I'm doing great. How are you? He's like, you know, I'm having a great day. Uh, life is good. Now, here's a man who needs help to wash, bathe, dress, eat, you name it, because his arthritis has really progressed. He's in pain constantly. He's on a drip of medication to manage his pain. But he, yet he's telling me he's having a great day. What's that about? The guy next to him with the hangnail, who's got a little tennis elbow and can't play his favorite game this weekend, is like practically crying, carrying on, yelling and screaming. And you put these two people next to each other, the one with the hangnails telling me he has 10 out of 10 pain, and the guy in the morphine drip saying, yeah, I think I'm about a two or three today. I'm doing pretty good. So <laughs> it's interesting. Is this subjective? Absolutely. Okay, pain is the first person perception. And the third person is another party talking about it. First person perception. So you can't ever really feel someone's pain, but you can imagine what the experience is like. And one of the keys here is to be able to describe what that experience is like. Can you now pick up three ways that pain benefits us? So I'd love to see on the Q&A, is pain good for anything or is it good for nothing? I'd like to hear what you say. So I'm thinking, well, Ah, it could be a warning sign, thank you, Shannon, of a larger problem. Something is wrong, Stephanie, yes. Body could be telling you its limits because some people just don't know how to go past, you know, stop going past those limits. It protects us. It tells us when we're overdoing something. So there's a protective benefit to pain, isn't there? It's a protective mechanism. We want to avoid further injury, okay? And you can figure out what you tolerate, what you don't tolerate. Thank you so much. We're getting a lot of great answers. Okay, it keeps us from doing things that may be harmful, right? Damaging. But however, especially for our athletes who just are on the go, they want to make it happen. And, you know, bless their hearts for that. But sometimes we have to put the kibosh on that, don't we? Sometimes it's a motivator, right? Sometimes you have to focus on biomechanics and not, not poor function. So, Having pain can motivate you to do something to get rid of it, right? That's something very, very common. And of course, Mary Beth's saying, yeah, some people like pain. So there's so much of a subjective nature, but pain does have benefits. And I find that if I remind my clients who are coming in with pain to think about, can you actually appreciate your pain? Can you understand you know, how the pain is benefiting? Because then they become less afraid of it. And when you bring up appreciation, you bring up a sense of gratitude, it alters the perception of pain remarkably. And we're going to be talking more about that altered pain perception and all the different things we can do to do it. So I wanted to thank you for joining us tonight. Glad that you're here. Hopefully it won't be too painful for you to go through a whole three hours of talking about pain, but at least you'll know just what to do about it. So I am Teresa Schmidt. I'm an orthopedic physical therapist, massage therapist, hypnotherapist, and shaman, and I do a lot of wonderful work for people, especially with those chronic pain issues, those pains that just don't seem to go away with just medication or whatever the latest and the greatest was that these people try. I often get people in the office who say, I've tried everything. I'm like, well, I haven't seen you before, so not quite everything just yet, but there's always more to learn there's always more to try. So even for someone that I feel I can't help enough, I like to make sure I refer. I got a great referral network. Build up your referral network because sometimes pain requires quite a few interventions, not just one type of therapy. Let's take a look first at what is chronic pain. This is a huge issue. Acute pain is that new pain, right? It can be present for up to three months. Typically, we think of acute pain as being you know, a couple of days and then subacute from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. But when it's chronic and persistent, that's pain that's going on and on for over three months by definition. And this statistic really did surprise me that it affects up to 20% of people around the world. So this is a huge, huge issue. And that means that there's plenty of pain to go around and plenty of work for us to do to see what we can do to help people who have chronic pain in particular. So it's really a national health issue. It's costing a huge amount of money. In this country, America, 50 million adults have chronic pain. That doesn't even include the children. How many children have chronic pain? Say juvenile rheumatoid arthritis as an example. 
and almost 20 million have pain that actually is what we call high impact pain. It interferes with their ability to do everyday things. They can't do the things that they love. Many times you're not able to work or go to school. And that's what we call high impact pain because it's really affecting someone's life. If you're looking at the, like the world health definitions, we're looking at how an issue, a diagnostic issue, for example, affects someone's ability to participate in activities. You know, what kind of limitations are there? What kind of participation restrictions are there? So chronic pain is really also very much related these days, and we're spending tons of tax dollars on figuring out what to do with the opioid crisis, whether it's stopping the opiates from coming into the country, trying to dispel the distribution of opiates that are already in the country, get that under control. There is a tremendous amount of overdose of opioid drugs, whether it's fentanyl, morphine, heroin, and other drugs, the opioids, tend to become highly addictive and then people take more and more over time and overdoses tend to shut down your respiratory system. So it's something that can be a killer. You know, there's been a whole issue in the last couple of years about, you know, first responders carrying uh, and other medications to get help for people with overdoses. And there was a big controversy about that. So does anyone have uh, issues with that. I see Gary said it brought to mind Tom Petty. So I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Now we also have synthetic opioid medication and the combinations that are going on, especially in the street. You know, in the last couple of years, as you probably know, uh, physicians who used to prescribe plenty of opiates to help people in pain, it was like the go-to medication. Now they're told, oh, no, you're not supposed to be prescribing opioids. There's just been too much of an issue with them. Too many people with morbidity and mortality as a result of opioid addiction or overdosing. So now it's going the opposite. People who need pain medication often can't get it, right? And there's a devastating rise in deaths in the last 20 years. So, you know, the government has really gotten very serious about this <clears throat> and they've made it difficult for doctors to prescribe opiates, especially for chronic pain. They're still out there for acute pain. You know, somebody goes to the dentist, gets a wisdom tooth pulled out or something, a root canal. Yes, they're often getting that still post-surgically. But the chronic pain people, I've had patients coming into my office crying, saying, Teresa, I don't know what to do. My doctors took away my pain meds. I can't function. I can't do anything. And they are hysterical. But we have other answers. We have other options. So what are the top three methods you use? Go ahead, write them down now because we're going to review them later. Right. What are the top three methods you use to manage pain? I'm going to take a little peek at the Q&A. Uh, <clears throat> Miranda uh, wanted to know how the U.S. did compared to different countries in regards to overdoses. I don't know those statistics, but you could simply uh, Google that online. And I'm seeing for a lot of our folks out there, things like distracting from pain, using a TENS unit, uh, helping people with stretching, soft tissue mobilization. Uh, modalities can be really helpful. So lots of people still using modalities, even though many of the insurance companies don't pay for them or pay, pay very little for them. So I see ice, tens, massage, relaxation, you know, lots of good stuff that we're doing to help people in pain. Uh, breathing exercises, gradual exercises, increasing them. Uh, one of the therapists said she's using spinal cord stimulation in a little bit of a different field now. So that's very interesting. Uh, somebody wants to know, uh, Amy wants to know if anyone is using Kratom or natural things. We're going to talk about the natural things tonight. Uh, pain neuroscience in particular is going to be one of our favorite topics later this evening. And then proper body mechanics, movement. Many people don't realize how poorly they are moving when they're in pain. and They're giving themselves more pain without realizing it. So the standards of the therapy, bracing, you know, helping to explain patients. You know, explain to them what does the pain really mean, right? Some people are using grass and tools, uh, pain science education, PNE we call that, ice, ibuprofen. So anti-inflammatories can often be helpful for pain. Again, being medication, they are going to have some side effects there. Lifestyle medications. Thank you, Sharon, for that huge, huge. And Jeremy's using whole body cryotherapy. So who wants to chill out? Yes, yeah, some people are doing some lowering of body temperature with that whole body cryotherapy. If you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, your work with that, that would be just ideal. So dry needling, acupuncture, uh, very different. And it really depends, as Gary says, upon what phase of healing someone is in. 
as far as you know what can be employed to help. So let's move forward and just see what is the fifth vital sign. It's pain. We measure it. We like to see what's happening. So could you survive without pain? Well, for those of you who like to go crossing the Brooklyn Bridge, there it is from uh, my whole hometown, New York City. Uh, some people think running is joyful and feels great, and other people I know think running is outrageously painful. <laughs> There's an example for you. Everyone's different. So going back to that chronic pain, uh, chronic primary pain, that's a disease in itself unrelated to other conditions. So that's a big issue because it just seems to come out of nowhere. It used to be called nonspecific chronic pain. Remember, we had that change from ICD-9 to ICD-10 in terms of the diagnostic categories that are used. So uh, bringing about distress and disability, nonspecific pain. Things like pelvic pain, headaches, migraines, irritable bowel, where people have that cramping, they have alternating bouts of gut, diarrhea, constipation, you know, very much discomfort in the bowel. So chronic musculoskeletal disorders. These are all examples of chronic primary pain. It's not due to another disease. Now, chronic secondary pain, of course, that is due to another disease. Now, there's going to be some polling questions as we go. So just pay a little attention so you can answer the questions as we go. And if you are taking this as a home study later, there's a little quiz at the end. So you might want to just know the details and what separates these different things. So. What is secondary chronic pain? Well, we have six types of those, and we have all kinds of classifications for pain because there's so much of it out there. So post-traumatic, post-surgical, of course, that's something we commonly deal with in therapy as people refer to us. Dental pain, oh, that's nothing like having a toothache. I was once on an airplane and I'd been post-root canal. I didn't know I had an infection. And I, was, I thought I was gonna take that plane down because the pain was so intense from being in the plane. So dental pain can be absolutely horrendous. Thank heavens for the dentist to help us out. Cancer, huge, huge reason for secondary pain. And often that can also include neuropathic pain, which could be central neuropathic pain mediated by the central nervous system or peripheral. The peripheral neuropathy, maybe someone has a disease such as diabetes creating neuropathic pain. Musculoskeletal pain, of course, you know, secondary to musculoskeletal problem, typically an injury, maybe it's an overuse. And of course, visceral pain, which often starts as something practically invisible and then turns into a horrific kind of pain, very, very uh, hard to diagnose that. So something to pay attention to, typically the visceral pain ends people in the emergency room. So let's take a look at what is pain. Now, you know, there are so many different associations just studying pain like here you're just looking to the International Association for the Study of Pain the American Pain Society they have diagnosed this and then they change a definition made a new definition it's basically an unpleasant sensory and emotional and that's the key it's not just a physical thing pain is both sensory and emotional experience it arises from actual or potential tissue tissue damage so, Tissue doesn't have to be damaged already, it could simply be potential damage. And it's described in terms of the damage. And if you wanna do a little internet search, take a look just for kicks at some of the different societies for pain. You have the American Chronic Pain Association, American Pain Association, American Academy of Pain Medicine, American Academy of Pain, and US Pain Foundation. There's more than that even, but I was just amazed when looking at how many people are studying pain and trying to help and manage the issue. So of course, as we said, this is a subjective experience. I can never really understand what kind of pain my patient is feeling, but I could try to be sympathetic. It's just hard to be empathetic. Right? It's first person and it's so many factors are engaged in pain. Objectively, we need to assess, to evaluate, and come up with some type of a quantitative version of describing someone's pain for the medical record. And that's really observing the person's response. So response with pain, that's nociception. Observable activity in the nervous system in response to an adequate stimulus. And that adequate stimulus, something that provokes pain, such as stepping on a nail, right? So that's the third person perspective, the objective perspective, okay? And it's a function of a specific sensory system. So there's different types of sensory systems, different types of pain. We're going to take a look at them because many people 
easily discriminate between different types of pain. Others, it's just pain. They can't tell you the difference, one or the other type of thing. It just hurts, and no matter what you do, it just hurts. I'll, I'll work with some patients, and they'll come into the office, oh, my pain's a 9 out of 10. And I'll work with them. I'm doing some myofascial release, maybe some cranial sacral, some precision exercises. I could be using some ice. How is the pain now? Oh, it still hurts. <clears throat> well, you said it was a 9 out of 10 earlier. What number is it now from 0 to 10? Oh, it still hurts. How much? <laughs> Trying to get that number out of them is really something else. And, and I've even had patients say to me, well, I don't relate to numbers. I can't give you a number. I said, well, here's a number for you. The insurance company is going to pay X dollars for your visit. I don't take insurance. Here's my fee. So say if that particular issue, the fee was $100, I said, here's a number for you. Give me a number from zero to 10 because otherwise it's $100 and they decide not to pay you anything back for coming here for therapy. All of a sudden they know all about the numbers. Oh yeah, now it's a seven. So it's interesting how people perceive of that. So pain is something very subjective. Some people want to just lay down and forget about it all, sleep it off. Some people just get moving to try to make it go away, distract themselves. Such a difference in the response. So what about that conceptual framework? <clears throat> when someone comes in with chronic pain, often they call themselves pain patients. We as clinicians often call them pain patients. And very often there is this perception of a victim mentality. You know, these people feel themselves, you know, they're ill, they're a victim of their disease or an accident that happened to them that's, that's caused the pain that they have. And they have a lot of reinforcements for certain behaviors. Now this may or may not be true of an individual patient who has chronic pain, but this is based on what's out in the literature as well as my clinical experience. They relate to certain things because it's what they're used to. I need to take strong medicine for my pain. And my doctor said he's not giving me the medication anymore you know, with the opiates and now what he's giving me, telling me to take acetaminophen, it's just not enough. And others, I can't drive. I have too much of a headache. I can't drive. So they have someone driving them around all the time. Or I can't work. I'm in too much pain to work. I need to rest. I'm too tired. Right? So many times people just need a little validation. They may go on and on about what they can't do, but sometimes it's just nice to lend a compassionate ear, lend a compassionate hand to people and validate them. Yes, I hear you. I understand. I can't feel your pain, but I understand that it must be awfully difficult for you. I'm going to try to find ways for you to manage this situation. I might not be able to get rid of all of your pain, but if we could change your body's response and your mind's response to the pain so that you can have a fuller, more meaningful life, a happier lifestyle, that would be great, wouldn't it? So let's see if we can move past this. But you know, I've had too many patients come in and say, yeah, I talked to the doctor and all she did was type away at her computer. She never even looked at me, never even validated that I had pain, just wanted to know what I couldn't do. And again, that's that functional aspect. We're always measuring function in people. Sometimes you just simply have to be compassionate and validate. Yes, I understand how difficult this must be for you. Let's see what we could do. Because many times patients will come in, oh, the doctor says it's all in my head. Everybody thinks it's all in my head. They can't see my pain, so therefore it's not there. And that could really add to someone's depression. It really can. When you know, patients have come in with me for years, and I'm in practice I know, a long time, 35 years, and still working on it. And when patients come in saying, how, yeah, I, I told people about my pain, I told my doctor about my pain, and they just ignored it. They said it's all in my head. And I like to look at them closely, listen, pause a moment and say, hey, you know, last I looked, your head's still attached to your body. So you know what? It's in your head and it's in your body. Let's see what we can do about that. So how many of you get the patients on the other side of the coin? You know, get the plumber in, he's got the six kids, he's got to work, his, his arm is practically falling off from a chronic tennis elbow. He's inflamed, it's hot, it's swollen, and he's still working. He's like, well, I have to, you know, feed my six kids. I can't just take off from work, yada, yada. I said, well, gee, if you could take off just for enough time to get the inflammation down, you might be able to get some healing going and not keep overdoing it by twisting and turning those pipes. So some people are dismissive and they just keep going, causing themselves more pain. I had years ago, a physician I, I knew 
referred a family member to me and huge tennis buffs. So the family member had a chronic, horrific tennis elbow. She couldn't even close her hand. She really couldn't use it for anything functional, had trouble buttoning shirts, you name it. And this is like an average healthy athletic person. But they insisted they have to just keep on playing tennis. You know, they have games, they can't miss it. This is, this is their lifestyle. And they just keep on taking medication to cover it up. Well, that person ended up literally shredding her elbow muscles. She had the doctor inject her multiple times a cortisone over and over until her tendons just shredded. And guess what? She couldn't play at all anymore because she wasn't willing to take the time to stop and hear her pain and act in her pain. So pain does require action. Sometimes people either get stuck in something where they stop altogether and others keep on going until they just can't. So it's something to find that balance. You know, some people just think, oh, pain's normal. And then much of this is socialization. Even culturally in the psychological literature, there's such a different socialization between cultures when it comes to pain. That's worth taking a look at and helping to understand people more who are suffering in pain. So for some people, it's just like, well, I'm getting old, of course it hurts. And other people are like, ah, oh, I don't ever want to get old, so I don't care how much it hurts, I'm not using the cane. I don't want anyone to see that I'm old. So lots of variations and responses. And these are things we need to honor in people and be compassionate about, learn more about that. So what is going on in, inside, right? When people are playing a role of a pain patient, right? They're identifying what's the most difficult thing to change about a person, their identity. I practice hypnosis. So someone may come into my office and say, yeah, you know, I'd like to stop smoking. Okay, great. Why? Well, I'm a smoker. I've always been a smoker. I'm a smoker since I'm in eighth grade. They might tell me, yeah, my wife wants me to quit. Okay. Do you want to quit? Well, I enjoy smoking, but she wants me to quit. Can I help that person? Not very likely because he doesn't want to quit. He has to want it. I could hypnotize him from here to kingdom come because it's his identity. I am a smoker. So it, you need to change that first. Same thing with people in pain. They get into a certain role. It's their identity. They always have a headache, right? And a lot of it has to do with how they cope and resilience, right? So some people will change their lifestyle to try to manage the pain, right? Like, oh, well, gee, instead of doing so much, I'll just take more breaks. Or I have athletes coming in, track and field athletes, you know, I'll wear my knee brace. I'm going skiing. I'll wear the brace then to make sure I could just keep going. And then others, you know, I got my fireman downtown after 9-11. You know, it's a badge of honor. I got the pain. I did this and that. And it is a badge of honor. I broke my back rescuing that kid after an accident. Yeah, so they're proud of it. They have a totally different interpretation of pain. So the key is, can we teach people to experience pain differently? And that's something I'd like to invite you to consider, right? Can we teach people how to adopt a resourceful attitude? And when I started in the field of physical therapy 35 years ago, it, everything was based on a pathoanatomical model. And we were supposed to separate mind and body. Well, physical therapists do the physical part. Psychotherapists do the psycho part. Social workers just deal with the socialization aspect of what's happening. No, it's important to recognize the mind, body, everything is connected. So attitude is something that we're responsible for, whether it's an OT, a PT, or massage therapist, your athletic trainer, your fitness trainer, whoever you are, nursing. Helping people adopt changes in their attitudes can be very, very rewarding to help them to have a meaningful life despite the fact that they have chronic pain. And I love this saying, the old Buddha saying, it says, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. It's one thing to have pain, but suffering where you're just so dead and down from it all, nothing seems to change, it's that depressive element, that element of giving up, that's optional. And many times people don't realize that they have a choice in how to respond. They have a choice to decide how to feel. And that's something where often people think, oh, emotions just come upon me and there they are. But you can actually take the time to pause and decide how to feel to feel differently. And just seeing there's a couple of uh, little tidbits on the chat box, Gary's saying there seems to be a different mindset between on the job injured and off the job. Any truth to that? 
Well, of course, whenever there's a secondary gain, there's an issue, right? I'll use an example. And these are, any examples I use are real patients, of course, no names or anything like that. So I had a guy come in and he had been scheduled for back surgery. He had the positive myelogram, the positive nerve root pinch, the foot drop, severe back pain, the whole nine yards and, you know, walking antalgic with the walker, just waiting to go for his surgery. And, you know, the last ditch effort of trying a little physical therapy. Well, I, I did agree that he would be needing the surgery. And he said, well, I'm not going, I need to go and visit uh, a relative before I go for this surgery because he was afraid he might not make it as an older person. So he flew on a 24 hour plane flight to go visit this relative. When he came back a couple of weeks later, his back pain was gone. He was happy. He was not using his walker or a cane. He was still walking stooped forward, but he said he was fine. And of course he canceled the surgery. So what was different? His mindset was very different after connecting with his family. I had another patient, young woman, hated her job. Oh, she came in with the back pain, same thing, early foot drop, lumbar radiculopathy, severe disc issues. She was scheduled for surgery. And you know, we were trying some traction with her, a whole bunch of different things. And she, she said, look, I'm going on vacation before I go for the surgery. And she was out on a worker's compensation claim for her back hated her job. All she did was complain about her boss and how terrible it was. And the funniest thing, I said, you, how can you possibly go to Jamaica? She's like, I'm going to Jamaica, man. <laughs> I'm going to have a good time. So she went. After she came back, she stopped in to see me. Her back pain was gone. She was walking just fine. This is after a week in Jamaica. Now, I don't know what she was smoking there or what they were doing there, but she came back just fine. So yes, there is a different mindset. And when people come away from some of the issues that could be potentially contributing to their pain, you notice that things change. And she too canceled her surgery and did not need any further physical therapy. So there is always, you know, more to the picture than meets the eye. And uh, Gary's also saying golfers are the worst. You can't keep them off the course long enough. Yeah, you know, and some of our athletes, they, they love their work and it's, their socialization is to keep on pushing even if it hurts. And that's not always in their favor. So let's take a look at the nociceptive system. And that's really nociception, pain perception. It's a warning system with an adequate stimulus. So the stimulus has to reach a certain threshold to be called nociceptive, to be perceived as painful, as something that you want to get away from. So there's different aspects to the system. You have your peripheral nociceptors out in the body. When they're stimulated because maybe you touch a hot pot, or you step on a tack, pull a muscle when you're running it and fall off a curb. So that transmission of pain at that point from the peripheral through the C fibers that carry pain, those are the thin nerve fibers that carry pain, that's called transduction, nociceptive transduction. Transmission is when the peripheral nerve sends a message up to the spinal cord, transmits the message. Modulation, and all those different acronym impulses come in to the dorsal root ganglia, the sensory root ganglia, and the spinal cord, and then make their way up that lateral spinal thalamic tract. That's the primary tract carrying pain impulses. So that's a modulation of the pain. Which impulses are going to get through? And then, of course, when the impulses reach the thalamus, they go through the thalamocortical tracts to the sensory cortex, and then the person perceives of it as pain. Is it something I really need to get away from? Is it something I could tolerate? What level can I tolerate? Like say, for example, you just poured yourself a hot cup of tea and you're carrying the cup before you realize how hot the cup is. You're saying, I'm halfway to the kitchen table. Either I'm gonna drop the cup right here because it's so hot it's burning my fingers or I'm gonna just run faster, get to the kitchen table and put the cup down so that I don't break it. Well, there is a decision-making process there in the brain. It's the same stimulus, a hot cup of tea, and you didn't realize it was that hot. So do you hold it? Do you drop it? Your brain makes a decision. So there's always an interpretation that's going on here. Now, a noxious stimulus. Mm, how about obnoxious, right? What's obnoxious? I'm just trying to see if I get that slide to switch off here. There we go. 
Stimulus that either threatens damage or insult or is actually damaging. And if you can imagine being the person in this particular image here, uh, these images are all borrowed from unsplash.com here. And uh, they're free if you're looking for that. Imagine uh, jet skiing. I do, do love jet skiing myself, but if you're inverted like that, could probably be a pretty obnoxious situation. So noxious and obnoxious come from the same place. Has to do with pain. Now, what happens next? Well, people get often confused about how they describe pain and what they talk about. And I'm getting a little bit of an issue on the clicker here with settings and global settings. So I'm trying to see if I get that to switch. There you go. So nomenclature for pain. Pardon me a minute while I get that slide back for you. There's lots of terms for pain and they can be very confusing because many sound alike. Hyperalgesia. That's when that pain threshold is lowered. So there's no implied mechanism here. It just means that a normal stimulus, okay, that would produce pain, that normal threshold is now lower. So whereas someone might say, oh, that music is so loud, it's killing my ears. When they reach a five out of 10 on a scale of decibels, right? Now that person is responding to pain when they're only at maybe a one or a two on a scale of zero to 10 in decibels. So there's a lowered threshold that's hyperalgesia. Hyperesthesia is there's a lowered threshold for both normal and painful stimulation, not just painful stimulation. So even normal stimuli, I see this often in my patients with fibromyalgia syndrome, you know that fibromyalgia is really something. If you want to learn more about that, a great course uh, I have on chronic pain with Allied Health, do feel free to check that out. So some of these people are feeling like things that don't bother anybody are hurting them. They're, they're hyper in their response to all kinds of stimuli, not just the kind that could be potentially damaging. So that's, that can be really annoying because that hypersensitivity makes people really hyper vigilant too. So hyperpathia, their response to painful stimuli is really hyperreactive. That's why they actually call it explosive. So they have increased threshold there. Allodynia. This is where their pain threshold is lowered. So a little bit different than hyperalgesia because there's no specificity related to it. So they could have some super sensitization of their skin. Many normal stimuli that don't bother you know, everyday people without this condition, those things will be hypersensitive to them. Pulling a shirt over their skin. The skin could be so sensitive with allodynia that just touching the shirt or the blouse over their skin is really sensitive to the point of being painful. Think about your patients who might have RSD, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, often known as complex regional pain syndrome. Allodynia is a typical component of that where, you know, I had a lady come in who supposedly went to the best heart hospital in New York and she went for heart surgery and they left a piece of the catheter in her popliteal artery. And of course it cut off the circulation to her leg. She lost three and a half toes. It was a nightmare. Uh, she had this horrific allodynia where all throughout her leg, not just where the toes were involved or where she had scars from skin grafts, but throughout the whole leg had this allodynia. You, you could barely look at her. She would start in tears because of the pain. So this is often very common with trauma. I had a guy who had a crush injury to his leg. A truck ran over his leg. Same thing. Everything hurt. Even sometimes just looking at these people, they think you're going to touch them. It's hurting. So paresthesias, of course, these are just strange sensations that uh, either come about by themselves or they're just naturally there or they can be provoked. And that's, that might be like tingling and numbness. How about dysesthesia? And that would be, again, spontaneous. It's just there on its only or provoke abnormal, unpleasant, painful sensations. And a lot of these can be a little confusing. And of course, is hypoalgesia. They have an elevated threshold to stimuli, so they're less responsive. They're not responsive enough to pain, so hypoalgesia. Now, some people might think that's a good thing. Oh, we won't feel as much pain. There's even a genetic disorder in which someone has no pain. They don't perceive pain at all. And of course, they could very easily be damaged. They could cut themselves, be bleeding, have no idea. 
right? They could break a bone and not know it's there. So that's not a good situation either. So more terminology for pain, sensitization. Normally painful stimuli, they have a lower threshold for that. So they have a hyperactive pain response, sensitization. The nervous system's on the high alert. And that could be mediated centrally or peripherally. In central sensitization, that's the elevated response of the brain and spinal cord to painful stimuli. In peripheral sensitization, there's a reduced firing threshold or an elevated bias, okay, of the peripheral nociceptive neurons. So it could be central or peripheral. And of course, what is a pain threshold? Okay. What's the level of stimulus that can actually produce a pain response? That's a pain threshold. And there's lots of different ways that this is tested in the literature. Uh, there are uh, different mechanisms for testing pain using something like a pressure pain threshold or PPT. With a pressure pain threshold, they actually use a pressure algometer that measures, for instance, how much pressure they're putting on, how many grams of pressure before a subject says, ow, that hurts. One subject might say, hey, you gave me 28 grams of pressure, that hurts. Another subject will say, hey, you gave me 500 grams of pressure before it hurts. Everyone's different, but that level at which they'll complain of pain to a given stimulus is the pain threshold. And of course, everyone has different pain tolerance levels. You know, I know people who can walk on hot coals and not have a problem, and other times people can't walk across just hot sand at the beach. So there's a different tolerance level, and that's very subjective. And uh, that's something I've noticed just in my own experience. That I always uh, <laughs> had a distaste for running barefoot on hot pavements on the way to the beach or running on hot sand on a 98 degree day. But yet I was able to sign up for three different times, not one, not two, but three different times of walking across flaming hot coals. And I was able to do that both in 10 foot level and 40 foot. So what made it different? The mental approach to the whole situation. So interesting stuff. Okay, so just add one other comment on the chat. Gary says, people with fibromyalgia in general seem to have something stressful in their life. When patients are on the table, they'll let you know, yes, because there's always that biopsychosocial aspect. And we need to appreciate that and to be compassionate and understanding of that and make sure that it's addressed appropriately. We'll talk more about that. Thank you, Gary. Polling question number one, just to see if you're paying attention. What is the term for a patient's lowered pain threshold, increased pain response from a normal threshold stimulus that produces pain? Hmm, what could that be? Hyperalgesia, anesthesia, dysesthesia, or allodynia? Let's see what you got there. Okay, I think uh, about 75% of you or so got it right so far. Hyperalgesia. That pain threshold is lower, and then a normal stimulus could also cause pain when it shouldn't. So that would be hyperalgesia. That's one of the more common terms that you'll hear when dealing with people in pain, hyperalgesia. So thank you so much. Let's move beyond that polling question. And take a look at, we talked about you know, social aspects and psychological aspects that have to do with pain. And what happens when someone comes across pain? Maybe an animal just bit them. Maybe they just got hit by a car. Maybe they bent over and simply bumped their head on the shelf when they got up. So, so many different things could be painful. Your sympathetic nervous system goes into an alarm reaction, a fight or flight reaction when there's pain or stress. Stressful situations are often interpreted as pain. Maybe not so much physical painful, but you get a lot of the same physical responses. And these are things that we can measure. You know, we're always looking for some kind of objective measurement of what's happening in the body. And these are things you can see, pupillary dilations. You see those pupils get bigger. Heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up. They're breathing faster and harder. The heart is pumping harder. So they are sweating. Of course, they get that cold, clammy fingers, right? 
increase glucose levels because the body knows better get that glucose get that sugar out in the blood be ready for fight or flight you know, bears chasing them in the woods they got to be able to run muggers chasing them down the street yeah you got to run or you have to turn around and face them and fight so you need that blood sugar to have that energy to make those muscles work where does the blood come from when stressed the blood leaves the digestive system where it's been happily helping to digest your food and assimilate your food and it goes into your muscles. So the muscles tense, getting ready for a fight or flight, ready to go. So that decrease in intestinal motility, what happens? The food just sits there. How many people with chronic stress have things like GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, irritable bowel syndrome, where they have those alternating bouts of diarrhea, constipation, or just you know heartburn, just some real irritable sense in the intestines. So that's partly because of with stress, the motility is gone, okay? So increased muscle tension, of course, the blood goes to the muscles ready for fight or flight. So that's a sympathetic reaction or alarm reaction. That is something that we can help to modify with training. So let's take a look at pain, uh, pain theories. Pain is very complex. And so just imagine, I'll just tell you a little funny story. I was out in Arizona with a friend and uh, we were hiking uh, really early in the morning because it was about 100 and something degrees. So we were hiking at like six o'clock in the morning and she started sliding down the sandy hill and guess what she landed on? You got it, cacti, lots of cacti. And I'll never forget later in the day, pulling individual needles out of her thigh and behind <laughs> from the cactus. Now that hurts. You don't need to have a theory about that. Nothing, nothing like having pain from cacti needles being stuck in your butt. Okay, now, now that I've given you a little visual for that, we can move on to the gait control theory. You probably remember if you've learned about electrical stimulation, uh, the theory of Melzack and Wall, very well published over the years, going back to the 60s, that as pain comes into the body, goes through the nociceptive system, comes in through the peripheral receptors, travels up the peripheral nerves to the spinal cord, goes into the dorsal horn, up the lateral spinal thalamic tract to the thalamus in the brain. Now, this whole different stimuli coming in at once, right? It's like many trains coming into Grand Central Station. Well, there's a gate, only so many trains could come in at once. So the thalamus has the job of opening or closing the gate. Well, pain, especially sharp pain, very noxious pain, travels in those small diameter C nerve fibers. If you want to, calm down the perception of pain. If you supersede the message of the C fibers, the thin fibers, small diameter, by exciting the larger afferent A fibers that carry sensations of pressure, you can in part block pain impulses. This is one of the ways that of course our electrical stimulation works. Electrical stimulation stimulates the A fibers, large diameter fibers. It's like saying, you know, she still has that New York accent, and I don't really want to hear it. So if you don't want to hear my New York accent, which is now being uh, converted into a New Hampshire accent, actually, but <laughs> if you don't want to hear that accent any longer, simply turn on your radio and turn it up, or just start asking everyone to speak more loudly than I am. And that's like saying you're stimulating the A fiber to cancel out the C fiber. You turn up the volume of what you want to hear, in order to not hear the volume of what you don't want to hear, right? The kids are screaming, turn up the TV, right? So same thing, if you're walking across the room, you're in a hurry, barefoot, stub your toe, ah, what do you do? Reach down, grab your toe, right? Put pressure on it. So very, very important that putting pressure on helps to stimulate the A fibers to modify the impulse transmission from the C. And yes, there are, a fibers beta and delta is the other. There are different levels, but this is just very basic. Thank you very much for pointing that out. So that's the gate control theory. We can modify the gate in terms of how that pain gets transmitted at the level of the thalamus and higher. So use an alternate input to modify the pain. What do we do when someone has pain? Well, frequently we put an ice pack on. That's an alternate input, right? Changes the nervous system. You can also go from the top down, right? That's a bottom-up approach. Putting ice on the area that hurts goes up to the brain. What about changing what the brain thinks 
going down from the top. Descending brain impulses can modify the signal. So we could change how people think, change the thoughts. When people are depressed, when people are feeling negative, upset, angry, what happens? The pain is actually, they've shown this in literature, the pain is actually perceived as being worse. All right, so negative thoughts open up those floodgates to pain, okay, open up the gates, whereas positive thoughts tend to close the gate. So can we help people by changing their mind, literally? Change your mind to change the pain, All right? When the brain's on pain, approach the brain with a different thought process. And there's lots of different techniques to do that. We'll explore some of those this evening. So when we teach people how to control their thoughts, we can have an impact on some of their pain perception. Now, what can we do to relieve pain without medication? Since that seems to be the big issue today, all the people with the opioid addiction and issues of docs not being able to prescribe opioids the way they used to, what can we do to relieve pain without medication? Well, we're going to use the biopsychosocial model. And that basically is using a combination of psychological training, helping people to think differently, educating them about the pain and about how the brain and body work in response to noxious stimuli, and especially with things like chronic pain. The noxious stimulus is long gone. They might have had an injury to their back 20 years ago, they're still having back pain. Well, they're no longer getting hit by a truck, but the pain is still there. Why? The truck's not coming at them any longer. Sure, there could be tissue damage. It could be a pathoanatomical reason for that. But there's also a loop that runs in the nervous system. And that loop is often hyperstimulated so that even a small amount of pain becomes exaggerated. So psychological training and education can be helpful. As a hypnotherapist, I recognize the value of hypnosis as a way to help people train not just their conscious mind, but with hypnosis, we look at the subconscious. The subconscious is always awake. It's interesting, when your conscious mind goes to sleep at night, you know, people say, well, how did the mom know that her child was crying in the other room when she had the door closed? Because in the subconscious, she knows I have to protect the baby. So that part of the brain is always awake. With hypnosis, we talk to the subconscious as well as the conscious. And there's things that you can do to help patients beyond just that. You don't have to go become a hypnotherapist, but using guided imagery and using distraction. In my office, we'd always have uh, television going in the gym. And, and then there's a show and people enjoying it and they're having a good time, especially if they're laughing. There's a lot less complaints of pain. If it's quiet, you have someone in a private room separately, oh, they can go on and on because they feel free. They have no distractions and then zoom focus on the pain. Very interesting. So can we shift their mind away from the pain? What about helping people to relax? We talked about a response to pain being an alert and alarm in the sympathetic nervous system. Well, can we tune into the parasympathetic system to quell that pain reaction? Okay, give them some deep breathing. You've all heard about this. You're all familiar with this. Progressive relaxation exercise. Okay, all very important. Lots of ways to help people to relax. So those biopsychosocial models are really important, especially today because if people with the chronic pain tend to be more disabled, we wanna get people moving back to a more high quality of life, meaningful quality of life, especially if they have that high impact pain that's interfering with everything they love to do. Now, George Engel came up with this whole concept of the biopsychosocial model. That was back in 1977, we're saying, yeah, you know, the old time version is the body's here, the mind is there, you know, the two don't meet, but they really do meet. So we have to include not just the medical model of pain, from a pathoanatomical standpoint that yes, there's something broken in the body, so now we have pain. There's social factors, there's psychological factors. We've seen this. It's just nice to see that it's now in print and now it's being researched very, very in depth. So on your examination, how do you screen for the type of pain that someone has? What do you ask them about pain other than from a scale of zero to 10, how bad does it hurt? I like to ask some questions about, are you afraid of moving? You know, did you think there's an issue of damaged nerve tissue? Do they have 
sharp pain, stabbing pain. You know, there, there's whole questionnaires on this that you can use for patients to describe the type of pain. Is it boring? Is it searing? Is it punishing? You know, the kind of words they use could tell you it's more of a psychological issue. And then if they're just referring back and back and back to, oh, that accident I was in, that accident I was in, oh, that person hurt me, and you know my lawyer is going to get them, right? So it's important. We have a legal system that's here to help people to be fairly compensated for their injuries. And that's a meaningful and important system. Some people, however, will look at that secondary gain as a reason to stay in pain beyond the time at which they stopped having it. <laughs> Frankly, I've had numerous patients tell me, yeah, you know, I, I can't go back to work yet because, you know, I have to stay home and take care of my husband because he got multiple sclerosis and we don't have someone else to take care of him. So as long as I'm out of work, then I could be home taking care of him. And I'm like, well, you have a worker's comp injury and I notice that you're moving just fine. I can't really find anything objectively measurable for you to be staying in therapy. And we need to address this. If this is an issue and you have a question about it, it needs to be addressed carefully and considerably with patients. So uh, just the fact that someone has secondary gain is not the only way to approach the situation. Just because they have secondary gain does not mean they're malingering. And I know it's, it's so common when I speak with other clinicians who are saying, oh yeah, it's a workers' comp case. Oh yeah, it's an accident case. Oh, they're full of baloney. Not really. I've come across too many people who have accidents and injuries and very often the system saying there's nothing wrong with them. And it's very clear that they have problems and it's not just a matter of secondary gain. So always question carefully. And if you can't find something, you know, objective about someone's pain and they're in a secondary gain situation, you need to honor that and refer to make sure that there's not something that you're missing, especially today when we have to see patients for such a short period of time, Frequently, you don't get the time to really explore what's happening with the patient and you hear the whole story, so you might just miss something. So give the patient the benefit of the doubt, always. Always give them the benefit of the doubt. Make sure you design your plan of care according to your examination. You know, what's the diagnosis? Like, and it, Typically, in physical therapy, we have a medical diagnosis, we have a PT diagnosis. We try to look at the mechanism of pain and then what's the actual impairment? What's the disablement that's related to that? So typically, especially from an insurance perspective, they generally don't pay for treatment for pain per se in therapy, but they're, they're paying to see, well, is there something quantifiable that we can measure that we can see change over time? Like the pain stops them from working, but what else stops them from working? Maybe they have a certain gait limitation. Maybe have, they have it physical activity limitation. Maybe there's a participation restriction and that's something that we could document. So you're looking to, is it a single pain mechanism or multiple pain mechanisms? So take a look at different types of pain. Take a deep breath and stretch. We're through our first hour. You're doing great guys. Again, on the Q&A, if there's something that you would like to share from your clinical experience, I'll go ahead and share that with the audience as much as we can here. Thank you for standing by. So pain types, nociceptive pain. Well, when you have pain nociceptors activated, that's nociceptive pain. Neuropathic pain is typically damage to the nervous system, typically due to trauma, or it could be chemical reaction in the body, it could be a disease process in the body. Non-neuropathic pain is that brain, spinal cord, central sensitization. There are adaptations in the nociceptive pathways at the brain level as a result of continuous stimulation, okay? Motor and psychosocial mechanisms influence the response. So very important because we deal with the motor and the movement mechanisms, we can come up with movement plans of action to help these people to get beyond their pain. I like to tell them, move beyond your pain. Don't just sit still. And of course, the psychosocial aspects, we're going to be dealing with that with the biopsychosocial model. <clears throat> Let's take a look first about making sure we can document measuring someone's pain. So there's a couple different ways of doing it. Many more than I could talk about tonight. We're just going to touch on these. The widespread pain index. And that's uh, many of these you can find online. If you go to, as you see on the slide here, the physiopedia.com has a lot of great information there. There's also a website called uh, Rehab Measures Database. 
It's changed its name to Shirley Ryan Abilities Lab. There's a database in there with a lot of different functional outcome measures, including measurements of pain. So you have a wiser pain index, right? They're given a body diagram and a quantitative assessment of pain. They look at 19 regions. Now, where have you had pain in these regions? One point for each area for a total of 19. And if they get uh, seven points or more, it's non-neuropathic pain, okay? Generalized pain with a central sensitization. Numeric pain rating scale, we mentioned this before, from zero to 10, how bad does something hurt? There's also the faces scale that you might've seen. Um, I didn't get copyright permission to put a picture of this, but you know, you see the sad face on one side, the happy face on the other, and that's a zero to 10 to give them a little bit more of a qualitative view. There's a central sensitization inventory. And many of these, by the way, are downloadable for in individual clinician use, but they're not downloadable for things like in a webinar or something that's sold to you. So just so you know, you can access these. Central sensitization inventory is really looking at generalized pain with central sensitization. And uh, if they have 40 point score, it's non-neuropathic central sensitization pain. Uh, this is very famous McGill pain questionnaire. I'm sure you've heard of that. <clears throat> These are those self-reported outcomes. Questionnaires are like my favorite because you don't have to do a lot of work. Like the secretary gives the patient the questionnaire. They grade it. They fill it out. I interpret it. So it saves a tremendous amount of time. And this has three different sections. It looks at, you know, how strong is the pain, the intensity, did it change over time, and what is the quality of the pain? What does it feel like? So, um, some of the items about changing pain is eating, drinking, cold, heat, exercise, all the different things that can affect their pain. Does massage make it feel better or worse? Does work make it feel better or worse? So a higher score on the MPQ indicates a greater level of pain and disability, and there's a total score of 78 points. Now here's a link for you. There's that SRA Shirley Ryan Abilities Lab. So you can use these links to find multiple functional outcome measures, um, not just these, but uh, here you see the minimal, minimum detectable change for the MPQ is 11.9. I wish they just rounded out to a 12. It'd be a lot easier. Uh, minimal clinical important difference. If you have a difference over time of greater than five, this was checked uh, as an example in patients about osteoarthritis pain. Uh, it shows uh, you've met the MCID, minimal clinical important difference. You know, when it comes to looking at patients' progress over time, did they get better? Is it statistically significant? That minimal detectable change or minimal clinical important difference, these are very well outlined for many different conditions, and you can see that on that SRA lab uh, rehab measures database. Very, very nice, and it's, it's ongoing. It's updated all the time. It's free to look at. So really, really love this particular resource. Anybody out there using the SRA Lab Rehab Measures Database? Uh, how about the brief pain inventory? And that's where patients are rating, you know, how much medicine they take. Does it impact their daily life? How do they feel about it emotionally? How intense is the pain? Where is it? Uh, all of that. So there's both a short and a long version. A lot of these inventories start with a long version, and then we realize, oh, it takes so much time, and they bring it down to a shorter version. Uh, unfortunately, there's a fee to use this one, so I personally don't use it because I'm not going to pay fees to use pain inventories when there's lots of free ones out there that are really good. But just so you know about it, many times if you work for a, a big corporation, big hospital corporation, they probably have the license to use these. So the West Haven Yale multi-dimensional pain inventory, the YMPI, here's a link for that. And that's looking at three main domains, again, activity of daily living, you know, what's your response within the environment and their pain experience. This takes anywhere from, you know, up to a half an hour to do, so whether you want to spend that much time doing it, it just sometimes people want to have multiple inventories, so it's, it's a nice way to go. Uh, more subscale scores, greater pain intensity. Uh, questions here, uh, someone's saying, uh, can PTAs assess pain? Well, PTAs can measure pain. I was uh, acting chair of a PT assistant program in Manhattan a few years ago, and a physical therapist assistant could take the measurements, but it's the physical therapist that will interpret the measurements, determine what it means, and then use that information to set up a plan of care and goals for the patient. So, uh, Kristen, as a PTA, you may go ahead and measure these things. 
but you don't draw the conclusions. It would be the supervising physical therapist that draws the conclusions. So thank you, that was a great question. Thank you so much for that. Uh, fear avoidance belief questionnaires, FABQ. And this has a lot to do with how do people's uh, beliefs, how does their sense of self-efficacy uh, relate to their pain? Does it change their mobility? Does it change their motivation because they have pain? What about their coping mechanisms, their participation in work or life, their mental health? A lot of this related to their pain. Do they avoid things because of their pain? So that's a really great thing. 16 items, easy score, you know, from agree to disagree and very, very nice uh, thing to work with. So <clears throat> there's lots of somatic factors that we use to examine pain. I'm not going into all of these here because you already know how to do strength testing, range of motion, neurological testing. You know, look at their movement pattern changes, look at their exercise tolerance, their work tolerance. You know, this can be affected greatly by central sensitization. And central sensitivity is so much involved in people with chronic pain. Kinesiophobia. That's our term for fear of movement, right? How afraid are they of moving? And uh, if you've ever thrown your back out or done something that just hurts a lot, like broke a bone, you're afraid of moving that. You know what kinesiophobia is, is like. Okay, so that leads us to our next polling question. Polling question number two. In the uh, what model of chronic pain Psychological behavioral health factors play a role in the response to and experience of pain. Allopathic, homeodynamic, biopsychosocial, or acupuncture. So what model of chronic pain has psychological and behavioral health factors playing a role? You got it, biopsychosocial, beautiful. Okay, we're moving on. Did you get a little stretch during the question? So remember, we have to take into consideration not just the physical aspect of pain, but the emotional considerations. People tend to be afraid to move. I, I have, I'm thinking of a patient who had a back injury at work, and I remember on her initial exam, when asking her to flex forward to see how she could move, her back was out, and she screamed, and I could never get her to flex again. And all I did was ask her to bend forward. And no matter what, when I was reassessing her, I said, well, how can you bend forward now? She was much better. All of her movements are better. And she just refused to do it because she had that fear avoidance. Yet I could put something down on a table and say, oh, could you hand that to me? And she'll bend over, pick it up, give it to me, not even realizing that she's flexing forward the same way because she just has that psychological issue. So there are specific assessments for that. I'm not going to go into every single scale here, but you can go ahead and look some of these up. Uh, Center for Epidemiological Studies Depression Scale, Patient Health Questionnaire, State Trait Anxiety Inventory, that's very common in the literature. Tampa Scale of Kinesiophobia, I'll tell you, I haven't personally used that before, but that's in the literature. And the Injustice Experience Questionnaire, so this has a lot to do with people's affect. You could take a closer look. Now, <clears throat> Cognitive behavioral factors can be looked at a little bit more carefully with the brief IPQ, the illness perception questionnaire. Pain catastrophizing scale is very commonly used. I highly recommend that. Psychology inflexibility in pain scale. And a lot of these are looking at, you know, what's the prognosis? What do they expect of therapy? Do they really understand pain? You know, it explains what, what it means to them. And it looks at their resilience. Resilience, what is that? That ability to adapt is resilience. And we help people to gain resilience. It's something that is learnable, it's teachable. So social factors, take a look to see, you know, based on some of these questionnaires, is there environmental or social factor involved? I had some patients saying, yeah, you know, as long as, as I wasn't feeling good when I grew up, if I was sick, then, you know, my parents didn't hit me. So they learned to be sick because whenever they were sick, they weren't hit. And it's just a shame that this happens with people. But these are stories you hear from people. Look at the resources. Is someone living alone with no one to help them? They tend to get into a depression, they get into pain, they're not coming out, as opposed to having people around who could be supportive or not. You know, what are their significant others doing? Are they willing to alter their beliefs related to their pain? Some people simply have to 
accept the fact that yes, there's tissue damage, there's going to be pain. Now what? Now what? Now what do we do? Can we move beyond that in a lifestyle? Okay, so lots of issues of people's beliefs, and that's something that we can help people to retrain. <clears throat> now the government decided to act on this whole opioid crisis back in 2016, and it's a good thing they did. They created this Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. They said, we must look at the concept of chronic pain. It's costing the government a lot of money. It's costing people tremendous pain in terms of addiction, loss of lifestyle, everything. Suicides as a result of that. So to help manage pain in light of the opioid crisis, they made a task force. They said, what are the best practices for pain management that we have today outside of just opiate medication? And the bottom line was, can we take care of individuals using a multidisciplinary approach? So no one discipline, but a multidisciplinary approach and very, very heavy, heavy emphasis on, yes, you guessed it, the biopsychosocial model. They created an interagency task force, and the government loves to make interagencies, but they combine all different government agencies to address a situation, many minds to come up with the answers. So they said, well, the approach for best practice is multimodal, and we have to have guidelines for both acute pain, you know, post-surgical pain, and it has to be multidisciplinary. We got to include medications because they are necessary. Restorative therapies, BTOT, speech therapy, social work, all these different things, interventional procedures, what can be done, you know, do they need to have injections, what's happening. Complementary and integrative health options, we're going to focus on some of those today, and behavioral health and psychological therapies. So these are all the things that the government decided was a good idea, and it's based on having good research to back it up. So they have to manage that there's drug shortages. You know, so if one drug runs out, they need something else to take its place. They want to make sure there's good access to care. You know, in the rural areas, sometimes there's not as great access as in the cities. There's a lot of stigmas, too, for people who have been in pain and were taking pain medication. They're often embarrassed about telling people about their pain medications. So we need to have that non-judgmental approach. Now, patient and provider education, telemedicine is now huge, especially uh, right now we have that COVID-19 pandemic going on and telemedicine is booming, thank heavens. So, and we also need to address special populations, right? So pain management best practices, all of these are about, can we focus on non-pharmacologic approaches? And John Maxwell says the experience of pain or loss can be a formidably motivating force that echoes what someone was saying earlier with us. So let's take a look at some interventions for chronic pain. You know, we're rehab specialists, you know, chronic pain rehab, really focusing on changing someone's perception of pain and trying to lower the necessity to have medication. So, you know, I have patients say, yeah, my doctor is so mean she doesn't like me. She's not giving me my pain medicine. You know, she says there's nothing wrong with me. And they really need to take some responsibility to manage the pain on their own, as well as if they do need some medication, it shouldn't just simply be taken away. It has to be managed in a way that's humane and helpful and compassionate. So very, very important to realize that People can have a healthy, meaningful life despite the fact that there's pain. Many, many people do. Counseling is very, very common to help people in pain, whether it's individual, family, or group counseling. You know, behavioral therapy is very important for people because they use different types of psychological approaches, such as operant conditioning. Think like Pavlov's dog. You do a certain thing, you get a certain response. You ring a bell when you give the dog food, eventually you just give the dog the bell and they're salivating as if they're going to have food. So that's an example of operant conditioning like the Skinner model. You, you want to recognize for people not to be so sedentary in the light of pain, but that they can increase their function despite having pain. And deal with that fear and avoidance. Get people used to the fact, yeah, if you do move, it's not gonna kill you every time. Let's try a different way to move. And then of course, good reinforcement for positive behaviors. Cognitive behavioral therapy, I'm seeing some of the best literature out there for helping people in pain, especially I've seen it with uh, fibromyalgia when doing some of my research and studies on fibromyalgia. It's really teaching people how to think differently about situations, in this case about pain. 
So people have certain maladaptive behaviors when they have chronic pain, and they use that operant conditioning to help change those behaviors, to help people improve their coping abilities. Teaching people about what pain and emotion have in common, how they relate to each other, right? When we feel better, when we're happier, we feel less pain. So what can we do to be more happy in the face of having lots of pain? That can help. So things like learning to pace activities. Sometimes people in pain, you know, they're in a hurry, they're doing this and doing that, and the pain's just getting worse and worse. So sometimes just allowing them to relax, allowing them to pace themselves a little bit. You know what, you have all this time when you're doing stuff that's unpleasant, let's take a break here, let's take a break here and add some pleasant activities to break it up. So different ways they use that kind of behavioral therapy. So emotional awareness expression therapy. This is something they're using for that central sensitization of pain. And that's really, you know, looking at discussion, talking about it, expressing the emotion behind the pain. Because emotions are actually stored in the connective tissue. And a lot of people have trauma that involves a connective tissue. And the actual memories of emotions are also stored in the fascia. Candace Pertz, a psychoneuroimmunologist who's done tremendous work, you might think of looking at a book probably in your library, called uh, Molecules of Emotion molecules of emotion, talking about the neuropeptides that mediate pain and how they're stored in the heart and in the connective tissue. So helping people to express their emotions related to pain can be helpful to help diminish the perception of pain. One of the, the very popular things you've probably all have heard of is that mindfulness. Uh, and mindfulness-based stress reduction is a specific version of teaching mindfulness programs. And that was started by somebody named John Cabot Zinn some years ago, where he was using meditation, a process of focused concentration and breathing, to really train people to be aware what's happening in this present moment right now. Look, feel, listen, you know, perceive of what's happening in the moment right now, you know, the be here now situation. But the key is to perceive it without any judgment, without any criticism. So just perceive, here I am in this moment. It's not good, it's not bad, it's not black, it's not white, it's not red, it's not blue. It's, it's just what it is, an acceptance and a non-judgmental attitude. So that's very helpful to teach people to regulate pain on their own and improves awareness of what's going on around them. <clears throat> that be here now, we're gonna talk more about that. Another psychological approach is acceptance and commitment therapy. And again, it's teaching people to accept the feelings in the present moment. This is how I feel. This, instead of fighting it, so many people when they're in pain, they have all these things going on in the mind, fighting it, going over it, you know, spending time. Just observe the thoughts and be without an affect. Be a detached observer. And it teaches people to accept these experiences and it's shown to decrease pain especially related to activity avoidance, which is great because it gets people moving, it boosts mood, and it decreases disability. So acceptance, like acceptance of pain, doesn't mean resignation. It means understanding that something is what it is and that there's got to be a way through it. I love this quote from Michael J. Fox. As you know, the actor Michael J. Fox has uh, been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And he's been quite a light shining on helping people to understand how to deal with degenerative diseases. So uh, thank you, Michael, for that. That leads us to polling question number three. What have we got here? Which one of the following is not a type of pain perception? What's not a type of pain perception? Nociceptive, neuropathic, non-neuropathic, or anaphylactic? You got it, guys. Anaphylactic. Bam, you got that. One, two, three. Good job. Good job. So moving beyond the polling question to biofeedback. Um, I've used biofeedback in my practice for many years. There's lots of versions of it, and I love it. I just think it's a great way to help people get in touch with what their body is telling them. So many times we're in our heads or in our minds or thinking or doing, and we're not realizing what's happening in our bodies. So with biofeedback, that's actually instruments used to measure physiological functions like GSR. Galvanic skin resistance, that's feeling the difference in electrical resistance conductivity across the skin. That changes with sympathetic or parasympathetic activation. Of course, skin temperature, 
Skin temperature might typically be in the upper 80s, lower 90s uh, degrees Fahrenheit, and it goes down when they get nervous, they get that cold, clammy hand. Uh, the skin temperature rises when someone is more relaxed, more vasodilation in the periphery. So that's a great way to work. Uh, any of you are familiar with those mood rings? Remember years ago, the mood rings, uh, some or mood paper, this colored paper that looks black when it's cold, but when you place your finger on it, the warmth of your finger changes the color of that pad or that mood ring, and you can see it turn from black to red to green to blue, you know, a dark, dark blue. So the darker color, like black and red, colder, moving to green or blue, warmer. Uh, muscle activity, which is a surface EMG, electromyograms, looking at the activity of muscle. And of course, your pulse, your blood pressure, heart rate variability that's looking at how your pulse rhythm goes up and down over time. And there's some tremendous studies being done by the Institute of Heart Math, we'll talk about that later, looking at heart rate variability as a stress indicator. This is like real-time feedback telling people, what's going on in my body? What are these functions going on? And it's been effective for all kinds of things, neck pain, back pain, headache. You could lower your blood pressure to be aware of it. Many, many of us use biofeedback to help people activate muscles or deactivate muscles. And a lot of these have apps that people could use in their cell phone. So look at some of these apps, could be very, very helpful for people. So they are wearable devices, wonderful, easy, right at your fingertips, literally. Relaxation training, that could be done using biofeedback devices or without them. So progressive relaxation, things like if, if you remember the physiological relaxation exercise, Someone might come in with a headache, a cervicogenic headache, lots of tension in their neck. And what do we do? We tell, okay, you could try this right there where you are as long as it feels comfortable. Scrunch up your shoulders all the way. So elevate your scapula 100%. Hold it a few seconds. See what that tension feels like and then let it go. What was it like to release the tension? Now shrug your shoulders up 50% of the way. Not 100%, 50%. What does that tension feel like? Let it go. Now scrunch them up 25% of the way. What does that tension feel like? Let it go. Go ahead and try this exercise with me. Breathing as you're doing it. Now bring them up only 12% and let it go. And then 6%. Let it go. 3%. Let it go. Until you can barely tense the muscle, keep cutting it in half until people can appreciate, oh yeah, I recognize now when I'm holding tension, even at a small level. Because if you hold tension for a long time, even at a low level, that can start to contribute to trigger points in pain. And that could be altered by progressive relaxation exercise. So that was just an example. Having people focus on their breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. I tell people, put a hand on your belly, put a hand on your chest. Feel yourself breathing, go ahead and try that now. Feel yourself breathing. If you have one hand on your sternum and one hand on your abdomen and you're breathing, what's moving more, your sternum or your abdomen? Go ahead and take some breaths. Ah, if your sternum is moving more, you have more of a shallow breathing. That's more of a stress breathing. If your abdomen is moving more and your sternum is quieter, that's more of a relaxed breathing pattern. That's what we're looking to train with people. So help people with guided imagery, help people with working through the exercise, very easy to do. So hypnotherapy, that's really using an altered state of consciousness. All, you know, some people are afraid of being hypnotized because they think, oh, someone's gonna control what I'm thinking and tell me to do something stupid. And really we have a saying in hypnosis and that's all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. People can't really make you do what you don't really want to do subconsciously. So it can be used to heighten a relaxation response, to alter someone's attention, and it's been shown in study after study to help with pain control. And it's usually, usually helpful. I've used it for patients with pain control with lots of great results. So anything that you could do naturally, and, and, and people could even have a hypnosis session and record it. So they could go ahead and use that recording later. It's not something people have to continue going to a provider for. So powerful stuff. There's also lots of apps online you know, be careful and, and you know check out what apps are out there on helping people to relax but plenty of freebies neurostimulation is something so whether we're using tens transcutaneous electric stimulation like our high volt or low volt machines very helpful interferential 
machines, electric stim for modulating pain, very helpful. Magnetic forces, pulse electromagnetic fields have also shown some promise for pain. And uh, even though we don't like pain, the great art of life is sensation, to feel that we exist, even in pain. Mm, something to think about there. Brings us to polling question number four. Hmm. To manage pain with the public health opioid crisis, the US government created a task force to make recommendations on best practices for pain management, supporting an individualized care model with multidisciplinary approach using the biopsychosocial model. What is the name of that act? Hmm. What act was, was created in 2016? You got it. Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. Okay, we're moving on. You're doing great, guys. Stretch a little bit. This goes on for a while. Keep moving. Don't let yourself get in pain. Take some deep breaths. Stand up. Move around. Feel better. Now, conventional medicine for pain, of course, docs are famous for giving you that pain pill. Let me tell you, if, if I just had my tooth out, I'm happy to take that pain pill, okay? <laughs> They're good, but too much of them and too much dependence on them is not good. Let's see what we could do with behavioral <clears throat> and interventional interventions. So these are all what's recommended by the best practices of the task force, uh, interagency task force for chronic pain. So here we are, PT and OT, woohoo, we're there, we're included guys, we're recommended by the government, I love it. Some of the things we do best, exercise, movement therapy, you know, working on functional activities, of course, we have issues of reimbursement problems. The government recognizes that. Some people do not have access to care, either for financial reasons, location reasons, many things. So these are issues that need to be addressed. And there needs to be a multimodal approach <clears throat> with restorative therapies. So here's an interesting uh, quote from a physical therapist. Uh, working at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. She says, given how tedious and dull the hospital could be, I always expected hospital inpatients to be happy to see us. But they frequently had the opposite reaction. Patients cringed as soon as the door swung open to reveal, ta-da, physical therapy. <laughs> yeah. Pain and torture, PT, <laughs> physical therapy. So we've heard a lot of that from our patients, haven't we? Now, how about TENS? Lots of back and forth about the TENS, people saying it doesn't work, people saying it works great. I taught modalities as a physical therapy professor for some years. You know, there's plenty of research to back up TENS. And it's based on that gate control theory we talked about, but even the government says it's a lack of high quality evidence. But I'll tell you frankly, from looking at so many of the things we do, there's a lack of high quality evidence in many of the things we do. It doesn't mean that they're not worth doing, it just means we need better evidence. We need more studies. So they determined it's a safe option for home care, you know, gets people out of the clinic. <clears throat> it gets them to not have to pay for it. And I mean, I've used TENS personally. I find that it's very, very helpful when used appropriately. If you're going to use a physical agent, learn how to use it appropriately. Uh, thermal agents are great. You know, this is again, government talking, what's they find substantial evidence for the benefits of heat for back pain, moderate evidence for improvement in function and pain, and rate rest ice compression elevation therapy <clears throat> is great for the acute condition. So this is not you know new news to us, but this is just what the government's coming out. Therapeutic ultrasound, they say there's really insufficient evidence of this. You know, we know that's the deep heat from pulsed or continuous uh, sound waves that travel deep to the skin. Uh, I find ultrasound has been very, very helpful, especially for musculoskeletal conditions. But if everyone's using the same one megahertz. <laughs> of depth of penetration and 1.5 watts per centimeter squared for everybody and everything, of course it's not going to work. You need to know the dosage. So learn more about the modalities to apply them appropriately. A government found that bracing has short-term benefits, especially for instability. Well, that's often very true. Great alternative to drugs, especially if the joints are lax. Yeah, to give the joints some support, they're less likely to have pain because they're not going out of alignment. So, uh, but braces can be costly and cumbersome. They have cosmesis issues, but you know what? They're great when people need them. Of course, they didn't mention taping in this, but I would put taping in the bracing category as well. Uh, not as much older evidence that the government discovered in the interagency task force. 
traction, uh, use of a distracting force to separate the joints, especially neck and back pain. Uh, I contributed a chapter to a medical textbook on physical agents uh, on traction, and they are correct. There's insufficient high quality evidence, but you know what? I'll tell you from a clinical perspective, I was using traction for 35 years in my practice. There's a reason I kept using it because I could see clinical changes. So just because people have not produced the quality of evidence yet or done the kind of studies and published them, that's the other thing. Many studies are done, not published. So it doesn't mean that the intervention doesn't work. <clears throat> we need better studies, and that's true. So I know so many people with traction machines. I have three different types of traction machines because I find that it is incredibly effective when used correctly. So let's get some research out there. We know that motion is lotion, isn't it? We need to get things moving. Exercise and movement therapy is wonderful. We have lots of volumes of data on exercise and what works and why. But I could show you studies to say that stretching makes muscles weak. I could show you studies that say stretching makes muscles stronger. So it's all about the type of data, but fortunately we have a large volume of data and it's very encouraging that we can help to improve power, mobility, strength, and endurance, and that will help the pain. Getting people stronger to be able to tolerate doing more, building their endurance so that they can do more stuff before the pain hits. I've worked with people with fibromyalgia for years. They come in where they can only do maybe two or three minutes of a physical activity, then they're exhausted and in pain. I build up their aerobic endurance gradually and they don't like it. It takes a good four to six weeks to see a difference in that. But now all of a sudden, hey, I could do something for a half hour, 40 minutes before it starts to hurt, before I could only do it for three minutes. That's a big difference in quality of life, right? So that's important. How about massage therapy? Who doesn't love a great massage? Now I am a licensed massage therapist and I find that massage is something that's really been uh, kind of leaving the physical therapy field at least. I don't see a lot going on in the OT field either with traditional massage therapy, but I find it can be really, really helpful. And uh, as little as therapists say, oh, we don't have time to do massage because we have to have our, you know, we only have a certain number of minutes with the patient. We have to do something that's evidence-based. Well, there's plenty of evidence basis for massage. And even the government is recommending Swedish massage, shiatsu, deep tissue. Uh, very important for post-op relief, spinal pain, joint pain, headaches, anxiety reduction. But just like many of the other studies, there's not always great statistical strength. So let's get more studies going in these areas. Now, this is something more of an emerging trend, and that's going with the biopsychosocial model. Pain neuroscience education, what they call PNE. But really teaching about pain teaching patients about pain so they understand it instead of having that fear avoidance about it. And when patients learn that pain is not just a pathomechanical issue, but it's a brain and central nervous system interpretation of something that's happening in the body, teaching them about pain processing helps them to empower them so that they don't need to have that same level of fear and simply saying that, oh, the doctor said I had a herniated disc, therefore my back is out and I can't work again. Well, I, I can tell you that, what, 20-something percent of people have herniated discs and they don't necessarily have pain. So you could look at the statistics for that. It's not the herniated disc in and of itself, but is it actually compressing the nerve? And like I said, I had several patients who were scheduled for surgery and have MRIs and myelograms that all say that the nerve is being pinched. So the pathomechanics is there, yet over a course of a week or two, their condition changed remarkably. They have the same MRI. That didn't change, but their pain changed. So it's very interesting. We teach that brain plasticity results in that hypersensitization. We call that that central sensitization of the nervous system. So teaching patients that, you know what, sometimes the body's healed, but the pain's persisting because the brain and the nervous system has been altered. The processing of the pain has been altered. And because of that, you're still feeling pain when there's really no more damage going on. So we need to modify people's pain perception and help patients reconceptualize the pain. And that brings us to conceptualizing polling question number five. What is a mind-body therapy using mindfulness meditation that trains people to be aware of the present 
without judgment or criticism, improves awareness of physical experiences, and teaches people to self-regulate pain. Hmm, neurosis, Reiki, biofeedback, or mindfulness. <clears throat> being aware of the present moment, being mindful of the present moment. Hint, hint, you got it, mindfulness, and we're moving on. So with that central sensitization, what happens? Well, this brain plasticity is responsible for that lowered excitatory threshold of the neurons, right? And that's what's leading to chronic pain. So letting people know that this is a situation in your nervous system. It's not further damage that you have to be worried about, okay? It's just a, a sensitization of your nervous system. So that helps people to have a little bit more self-efficacy, less fear avoidance behavior, less kinesiophobia. Very important that they understand that. The brain is in charge. Pain does not always mean that there's something wrong, something broken. It's just that something might have been wrong and there could still be a pathoanatomical issue, but changing how the brain perceives of it, that central sensitization is key to then managing and moving past that pain. So the nervous system changes our contributors to the chronic pain. Those spinal neurons, as we said earlier, have an increased sensitivity to painful stimuli. Nociceptive threshold has been lowered. They're hypersensitive. It's part of the nervous system. So those action potentials, those messages from the nervous system, are amplified from the A delta. Someone mentioned this earlier. C nerve fibers and A beta mechanoreceptors, right? And then you find that we get what we call in osteopathic medicine facilitated segments where not just the injured area becomes sensitized, but the uninjured area also becomes hypersensitized. So if you have too many, say somebody has an injury, they have so many afferent impulses barraging the central nervous system. Maybe they were lifting something really heavy, bending their elbow, flexing their elbow, and they pulled their biceps brachialis really bad. And they dropped it and it shattered and it was just a mess. So they tore their bicep. Now, biceps mostly C5, say on the nerve root. So you have impulses shooting up from C5, C4, C6 into the nervous system saying, hey, we're injured, we're hurting here. Now those nervous impulses could start to overflow. The neurotransmitters could start overflowing to C4, C3, C7, C8 even though those particular nerve roots weren't involved directly in the injury. They become facilitated because of the overflow. So that's what we call facilitated segments. That's an aspect of central sensitization coming through the nervous system. So teaching people that this is a, a process of pain where things were hypersensitized, they start to understand and it becomes less fearful for them. So, you know, the injury, the damage is not necessarily the only cause of pain. And this has so many factors that contribute to how your brain perceives of pain. Your stress, your background, your genetics all contributes. Your social support systems or lack of support systems contribute. What about your physiology? I actually was, was reading a study that shows that you know, women have more sensitivity to pain than men. It's been documented. People with red hair have more sensitivity to pain than people who don't have red hair. So pain is physical and emotional. Women feel more pain than men. Remember, the brain doesn't feel pain. You can actually stab a brain. It doesn't feel pain. It interprets pain. That's the difference. Does anybody know what the most common type of pain is? Here's a little question for you. We should have put it in as a polling question. Let me see on the Q&A. Make sure you're still awake out there. What's the most common form of pain? What's the most common pain complaint that people have? I know you're out there, somebody's snoozing. Let me see an answer on that Q&A. Okay, somebody's saying uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is helpful to treat pain. Lumbago, you're right, you got it. Randy, lumbago, Sharon, back pain, Kristen, back pain, Karen, Cody. Daphne, Miranda, you got it. Back pain is the most common pain people have. What's the second most common form of pain? What's the second most common? Headache. You got it, Shannon. Got the headache there. That's the second most common. Kathleen, 
Ashley, yep, you got it, Karen. Right, okay, so we are awake out there. Woohoo, you guys are really cranking. And uh, it's interesting. How do you call in sick when you work for a doctor's office? Just thinking of some lighthearted things. And good health is just the slowest possible rate at which one can die, isn't it? Okay, we're moving on there, moving on there. Just making sure you're awake. Thank you so much. Doing great, guys, doing great. <clears throat> so what happens with central sensitization? We teach patients, you know what? Your, your injury was a couple of years ago. You got hit by that car. You know, you broke your arm. You broke your foot. The pain, your body's still sounding an alarm. The damage is over. But that nervous system got into this loop of sounding an alarm reaction. So if we educate patients about the science behind the pain, instead of just focusing on, well, yeah, you have this joint out of alignment and that's pinching the nerve and that's contributing to the pain. Yes, that's part of it. But the other contributor is that biopsychosocial. How is your mind reaction? So we can get better mobility, better participation, less catastrophizing when people are well educated. So let's educate people using the biopsychosocial model. If you want to get more information too, I invite you. Uh, here's a link if you have questions after the seminar is over and you want to get more resources, go to my website, edgesize.com, or check out, I always post helpful links and information on my Facebook page, as well as, as tons of freebies on the YouTube channel. So feel free to check those out later. We are going to dive into some integrative medicine approaches. But just think about it. I know some of you are getting a little tired. We're, we're just about into our third hour here, almost. And think about it. A healthy nap lengthens your life, but it shortens your work day. How wonderful is that, right? So let's see if using some integrative medicine approaches could make a difference. So all kinds of things that people do. Let's take a closer look. Some of these approaches are ancient and some of them are very, very novel. So what are they? We talked about some of the behavioral approaches like cognitive behavioral therapy, mind-body approaches, you know, some people, we didn't mention it here, do something called tapping, emotional freedom technique, or EFT. And that's where they actually tap with their fingers on different acupuncture points, and they say things while they're tapping on the acupuncture points. And that's, that's something very, very interesting. Uh, Noel says that he uses MPS and ETPS. So if you could tell me what that stands for, uh, I can share that with everybody. Uh, somebody wants to know if you get a bathroom break. Well, this is being recorded, so you can always come back, and if you want to take a quickie break, uh, be my guest, take a quickie break and come on back. I'll answer some of the Q&A, so if you need a bathroom break, go run now while we look at a little Q&A. Noel, if you could tell us what the MPS ETPS stands for, I could share that, you could tell us a little bit about that. And Ashley said she had a patient that swore by tapping and had a book about it. And I took a, a course on emotional freedom technique, which is the, the tapping model. And I've also trained in the uh, Asian bodywork system with acupressure and omotherapy. And stimulating acupuncture points can have a real interesting effect on pain. Of course, acupuncture itself has tremendous uh, good literature backup. And that's one of our integrative medicine approaches. So we mentioned, we touched on mindfulness and meditation and deep breathing. We'll touch on that again. Massage acupuncture is the needling of acupuncture points. Now think about dry needling. Uh, that's not considered an integrative medicine. Dry needling is using acupuncture needles to specific painful sites to help uh, move the fascia and stimulate the nervous system to gate the pain. However, acupuncture is stimulating those acupuncture points in a very specific way that relates to the whole field of Asian bodywork and, and oriental medicine, which is the five element theory. It's a whole different way of diagnosing and treating the body. It's not just putting in needles because you have a protocol for back pain, or needles is a protocol for headache, or needles is a protocol for bellyache. It's a very highly evolved system that's been around for more than 5,000 years. So anything that lasts that long, even with all the good research, it's gotta be good or people would have given it up long ago. Uh, manipulation, of course, joint mobilization, um, meditative movement therapies like yoga. Anybody out there doing yoga or Tai Chi? 
I love Tai Chi because it's like a movement meditation. It's very slow, gentle movements, weight bearing, helping the mind to focus on exactly what the body's doing. So often we're out of focus from our body, just thinking, 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 instead of feeling what's happening in the body. So it's important to bring patients back to appreciate what's happening in their bodies. Really, really critical to do. And they could get an idea of how to move beyond the pain by doing just that. <clears throat> so let's take a look here. We have our integrative medicine approaches. Uh, here I'm here with someone interesting. I want to introduce you to Dr. Frank Lowen, who's here in the picture with me. He's an incredible, incredible researcher and scientist, and he's published so many wonderful books about integrative medicine, in particular what we call energy medicine. And he's really looking at it from a physics standpoint. So, you know, back in the old days, everybody said, oh, well, it's hocus pocus and magic and this and that. And no, it's actually just stuff we hadn't researched well enough before. And this tremendous level of work, um, especially looking at body work and how the energy travels in the body. I attended a webinar this afternoon with the Fascia Research Congress. If you go to fasciacongress.org, you can look at some of this research, and they're now looking at the research at the interoceptive system in the body and how the body stores emotions. And it was a fascinating webinar looking at just that with uh, Dr. Robert Schleip from University of Ulm in Germany. Uh, do check out some of this. Check out some of Frank Lowen's work. It's, it's absolutely mind-expanding. So we talked about biofeedback already, but hey, art therapy, music therapy, supplements, nutrition, all kinds of stuff that can be used. Uh, spirituality, using the spiritual approach, right? Therapeutic touch, Reiki, lots of different integrative approaches. So we're going to take a little peek at each one, and I invite you to take a look at the National Institute of Health webpage, uh, the Office of uh, Alternative Medicine. And National Institute of Health has a very, very lovely collection of research, and it's growing for looking at this. Uh, now, just to mention, since some of you are probably just coming back from the bathroom, I guess, uh, Noel was saying dolphin neurostim is TENS and acupuncture together. I uh, guess one of my students was giving me a little insight about the dolphin neurostim uh, using TENS. I believe that's a microcurrent with acupuncture. Wonderful. Uh, many people have all these acronyms for things. They don't always recognize the acronyms. And uh, Gary actually brought his laptop to the bathroom. Thanks for sharing that, Gary. That's just great. I'm glad the sound was off. And MPS microcurrent point stimulation. Okay, great. Uh, I didn't realize they call MPS. I know about microcurrent is very, very helpful for pain. And especially for people who are super sensitive, the microcurrent electrotherapy is typically below the sensory stimulation level so that people who are really sensitive won't feel anything other than the electrode or the very, very slightest sensation of tingling on the pad, which is rare for microcurrent, but I have had some patients say that they could feel that. So let's look at the definition of alternative medicine, and it's from the Office of Alternative Medicine, National Institute of Health, non-mainstream approaches. And the key is they're used in place of conventional medicine. So people with alternative medicine they're not going to the doctor, they're doing just alternative medicine. So it's in place of conventional medicine. And as Charles Glassman would say, medicine's a funny business. After all, dispensing chemicals is considered mainstream, and diet nutrition is considered alternative. And I thought that was really interesting. So this is some food for thought for you. So complementary medicine, as opposed to alternative medicine, complementary medicine are the mainstream practices that are used together with traditional medicine. So put yoga together with a doctor, put the nutrition together with a doctor, and that's an interesting thing. This is all from the Department of Health and Human Services. So Health and Human Services, comprehensive solution to the opioid crisis. They basically summarize that we need additional evidence. You know what, every study I've ever read says more evidence is necessary. It's like the key thing to say, because we can always learn more. Uh, that we know we have reimbursement issues, especially with things like complementary medicine. We have enough reimbursement issues with traditional medicine. Practitioner education is critical because you know there are people who are licensed, and in the alternative or complementary health field, not everyone is licensed. I'm not saying that they should or shouldn't be. It's just something the government's bringing up that education level is an issue, and uh, we need to effectively describe the indications for these various 
non-mainstream approaches. <clears throat> Many people say, oh, use magnets for the pain. I bought these magnets and it really helped my pain. Well, that's just great, but how much power is in the magnet? Are you using a positive or a negative pole of the magnet? How many gauss or milligauss is that magnet? What's the dosage? I mean, if you just said, hey, take some aspirin for that pain. Well, gee, I could take a whole bottle of aspirin. I could take baby aspirin. I could take adult aspirin. I could take five aspirin. I could take two. I could take 25. What's the dosage? You know, how many milligrams in each pill? So the dosage and how much to take is so critical. And that's something we don't know enough about when it comes to things like using magnets or, or other types of approaches. So more evidence is necessary to describe. So here's some recommendations for integrative medicine from the Department of Health and Human Services. They do recommend acupuncture, massage, manipulation, that mindfulness, Tai Chi and yoga, music therapy, and spirituality. So they found enough evidence on all of these to actually make a recommendation for it. And I thought spirituality, having an evidence base was fascinating. And when I started to look at some of the research about faith-based approaches to health and pain relief, there is a huge and growing body of evidence and it really is quite remarkable. Going back for years. So acupuncture, of course, we're all familiar with that. It's Asian body work where we insult, insert needles in certain points that are considered energy channels or meridians. And it's used to stimulate the flow of chi or energy or life force through the body. Uh, the government says it's minimal risk when used by licensed professionals. And there have been enough evidence for spinal and knee pain, osteoarthritis, and migraines in the highest levels of research, systematic reviews, good news. Massage and manipulation, plenty of us doing that out there, right? Uh, Short-term relief is shown in many studies, so Thai massage, shiatsu, insufficient details, and I find this is true too. I'll see many studies on massage, myofascial release, osteopathic manipulation, but they don't say exactly what type of massage it was. Did they do effleurage to the left quadratus lumborum for 15 minutes at a moderate depth, followed by petrissage, followed by elbowing for 60 seconds or ischemic? They don't give enough detail in many of these. They're starting to come out with some more interesting massage studies with protocolized versions of massage, just to get a sense of what works. Uh, the Fascia Research Congress has a tremendous body of evidence. Just go to fasciacongress.org. Fascia Congress has tremendous research and regular webinars. I just took one this afternoon, as I said, they had a freebie out there uh, looking at all the different interventions. So great for post-op pain, spinal pain, joint pain, headaches, so much goodness out there with the massage and manipulation. So John Kabat-Zinn, the creator of the mindfulness terminology, not necessarily the concept altogether, but wrote the book about it. He says, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. And I love that. I love to share that with my patients who have chronic pain, because you know what? Sometimes you just have to live with it, but you learn how to surf. You learn how to deal with it. So mindfulness-based stress reduction is based on the work of John Kabat-Zinn, and that's altering pain perception by focusing on the present moment. Not judging, but being a detached observer. And it's big on acceptance. Like, oh, I have some pain, so let me be curious. Okay, there's the pain. It's not good, it's not bad. I'm not trying to get close to it or run away from it. I'm just doing accepting and be curious, what is it? What is it telling me? Where is it? You know, looking at it totally objectively and openly. And they have found in studies that it helps back pain as well as primary headache pain. So neat stuff. And it's being in the present, right? It's kind of like, we're always on autopilot. We're go, go, go mode. This is coming out of autopilot and really focusing on yourself and releasing any limiting thought patterns, meaning thoughts in which you're criticizing and judging, usually yourself or others. So there's a lot of freedom in that. It's something worth looking at. And this is some ideas that are based in meditation and contemplation approaches that date back centuries, multiculturally, well-recognized anthropologists around the world. A lot of these concentration or meditation techniques were used for people from ancient yogis to mystics in different religions and spiritual practices. And 
today is often used to create, treat chronic pain, depression, anxiety in patients, and it's been tremendously, tremendously helpful. And it helped people to reduce the amount of medication they need to take, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Lots of terms for this, whether it's meditation, contemplation, concentration, um, I've heard it called physiological relaxation to make it sound very medical. You know, it's the same thing. Very interesting. And uh, a couple of people are asking some questions. I'm just going to hold off those questions for a little bit. But just be aware that these practices, although they were traditionally considered more of a spiritual-based practice, they're really in a psychosocial, biopsychosocial aspect. But just being consciously aware. It's a lot to do with what there's these meditative approaches, these contemplative approaches, it's a lot about conscious awareness. So it doesn't have anything to do with people's religion. It's, it's not part of any particular religion. So if you want to be mindful yourself, you want to be able to teach patients to do so, you know, simply observe your thoughts very casually. If you take a few minutes just to be quiet, and we not necessarily have a lot of time to do that right now, but just close your eyes for a minute. I'll give you a mini peek at mindfulness. What's happening in your mind? And if we could leave the Q&A up, the questions just disappeared. I need to see those for later. Observe your thoughts. What's going on? How long is this webinar going to drone on for? Oh, gee, is this really going to help my patient who has that terrible pain that's always whining? Or, oh, I think I have to let the dog out now, but she didn't give us a bathroom break. So what's on your mind? I'm being quiet purposely for a moment. Note your thought patterns. What, what goes on in your mind? That internal chatterbox constantly. Be quiet for a moment and simply be aware of the space around you. What's in your environment? What do you see, hear, smell, taste, touch? feel a chair under your bottom, you feel the ground under your feet, you notice the lighting in the room, is there a humming in the background? So instead of thinking, oh, that droning noise of the humming of the refrigerator is really annoying, you're just noticing, oh, there's a humming. It's not good, it's not bad, it's not positive, it's not negative, it just is. So that's a concept of being mindful. I, I recommend try a few minutes on your own of just paying attention. And taking away, notice how much we criticize and judge and decide if something's good, bad, right, or wrong. Let it go and just be and watch what happens. Practice doing that for a few minutes at a time. You'll find that it can eventually be very relaxing, although when you first start doing it, you're so busy being surprised at how often we're getting our inner chatterbox ahead of us. And in yoga, many times people use mindful practices. They use meditative practices with breathing. Yoga is really a mind-body exercise. And it's been shown to help back pain, very limited adverse effects, according to the Health and Human Services Department at their review of the literature. And they like that it's very cost-effective in groups. There are so many different types of yoga, whether it involves use of sound like chanting, and breathing, because using sound incorporates your breathing in very specific ways to get really good respiratory control. And of course, all the different postures or asanas that they use, stretches, some forms of yoga are really built for strengthening. So don't think of it as just a stretching technique. There's so much more to it. Do, do check it out. Tai Chi, of course, is an ancient martial art. It's like a moving meditation, slow precision movements, almost looking like a slow motion dance. And using positions that are actually the basis for many martial arts that were you know, used for combat years ago and also for body control. It's been shown to strengthen the core and have really good outcomes for osteoarthritis and musculoskeletal pain. And it's been found to be safe and very cost effective in the long term. So that's always cost effective is always a huge thing. And safety is also huge. Music therapy has been shown to be very helpful. Uh, they don't have a lot of good statistical rigor in the studies, but they found in a meta-analysis, again, meta-analysis, systematic review, some of the higher levels of clinical research, reduces pain and has really good psychological uh, help for people who are terminally ill. And another systematic review said, you know, there's no real standardization for the music type. 
uh, used in music therapy in over 85 studies that they reviewed. But they seemed to find that the lack of lyrics was the universal element that was most helpful for pain management. So get, get the talking out of the music, take the lyrics out, and uh, they don't have enough in the music therapy studies to show exactly what kind of music works best. But uh, hey, why not? You know, I tell people, put on some of your favorite tunes and see what, what gets you rocking and rolling, help you feeling good. Now we have less than an hour to go here, so stretch, move around a little bit, hang in there, you're doing really great. Let's take a look at another Health and Human Services recommended intervention, and that is spirituality. Not necessarily religion. A lot of people equate religion and spirituality. Religion is based on specific ideas, concepts, or even dogmas that are put into an ideological context. Whereas spirituality is more an essence of someone's behavior, such as use of prayers or meditation or contemplative practices, uh, belief in something bigger than oneself. You know, it can also incorporate a search for meaning. So whether you are any of the main religions of the world, these are similar concepts that are incorporated into the religion, but could also be incorporated into another lifestyle in which someone does not have an established religion. And that search for meaning is critically important. So having a spiritual practice has shown very positive outcomes for pain management. You know, things like laying on of hands for health, how many spiritual practices are using this, and it can be incredibly helpful. So let's take a look at some of the spiritual-based interventions for pain. And uh, among these, these are many having some nice, uh, either well-established or emerging body of literature coming out. Therapeutic touch. Shamanism or shamanic practice, shamanic journeying, also sometimes called dream work, uh, Reiki, prayer and contemplation, integrated immune strengthening therapy, that's a newer one, and many types of religious centered or belief centered approaches. So, energy medicine tends to be often linked into the spirituality concept because the Approaches of belief and how energy works in your body are often very closely intertwined, but energy medicine is seeming to be coming into its own outside of the typically, you know, nomenclature of spiritual realm of things. But Rao did a systematic review on energy medicine and looked at 27 studies, and 13 of them showed substantial outcomes as a result, but they didn't have a high level of evidence for efficacy just yet but it's out there, so definitely worth looking at. And what exactly is energy medicine anyhow? So there is a chi or prana or energy, there's different terms used in different cultures to describe the effect of energy, which is really electromagnetic field, a flow of electricity, a flow of energy through the body. So whether you're talking about energy from the oxygen flow that energizes your body, or the flow of energy through your acupuncture points, the chi, we're all on a journey to discover and to quantify exactly what this energy is. So here's a peek at some of the literature backing it up. It really has a very nice physics backing. Uh, everything is filled with energy. Now, if you go back to physics, basic physics and quantum physics, everything has empty space. So whether you're looking at the solar system, the sun with planets going around it and moons going around those planets, there's empty space between the planets and the sun. Look at the atom. Look at the protons, neutrons, electrons. There's lots of empty space between the nucleus of the atom and the electrons and the orbitals around it. So there's energy there. So atoms and molecules, those spaces have energy even if you can't see it. Now think about it, you know, 200 years ago, somebody said invisible waves are traveling across the world and they can show you what someone is doing on the other side of the world, in Indonesia or India or Russia or China or Antarctica, right? They would be burned at the stake, right? Everybody said, they're nuts, they're crazy. Well, what do we call that? Satellites, internet, right? The telephone. So this is just what exists. Just because I don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Can you see gravity? But what are we doing all day with our patients? We're giving them exercises and training and movement 
in regard to something we can't even see, gravity. But we sure can feel it, can't we? Yes, we can. So a lot of this commonplace knowledge of today is something that back when wasn't something that was recognized. So we know that energy is everywhere. There's something called the zero point field, and that's an energy field that connects all the things that exist in the universe. And this is something recognized by physicists and Nobel laureates across the globe. McTaggart, Lynn McTaggart, is a tremendous uh, best-selling author, and she's interviewed Nobel laureate physicists and scientists around the world. And she's describing how that zero point field, where these microscopic vibrations exist in the space between things, everything is in a state of vibration. So that you're talking about the vibration of the waves of the sun, the vibration of the music coming out of your radio, the vibration coming out of my voice, the vibration of the heat, the infrared heat that my body is giving off. You know, everything has a web of interconnection. That web is in an energetic field. A Nobel laureate said, Georgie, saying molecules don't have to touch each other to interact. And they've shown this. So it's simply even just looking at a study, observing a study, when you're not in the study, you're not one of the interventions or the variables, you are a variable even when you don't realize it because you change the re response simply by observing it. So energy flows through this electromagnetic field along with the water forms the matrix of life. So some modern perspectives, you know, we're so used to a biomolecular model and a chemical model, now we're starting to look a little bit more at the role of electromagnetic fields or quantum physics energy. I think about the microcurrents. Someone was asking about microcurrent earlier and now that's being used to help pain and tissue healing. And if you can't feel microcurrent, is it really there? Indeed, I could be in the sun. I can't feel that I'm getting a sunburn right away, but I notice later, right? So just because I don't see it or feel it right away doesn't mean it's not there. How many people develop cancer later in life by taking in small amounts of toxic chemicals across a lifetime that they didn't feel or taste or know were there, but yet they are. So everything communicates, and then there's a certain role in that communication of consciousness and intuition. Our bodies are electrical units. We are conductors of electricity. We have salts. We, we have a lot of dipoles in our body. Electricity is what makes our muscles contract, makes our heartbeat, makes us think in our minds, so we always have electromagnetic fields. Those acupuncture points are points of reduced electrical resistance in the body. Trigger points are areas of reduced electrical resistance in the body. There's an energy flow there. And they've now shown a positive correlation between the fascial planes, where your fascia lines connect in the body, layers of fascia connect, and the acupuncture channels where the energy flows. And they've also related that now to emotions and how that's stored in the fascia. So everything communicates in the body through bioelectricity, biomagnetism. The electromagnetic field of your heart can be measured with magnetometers 10 to 15 feet off your body. <clears throat> so you are influencing the electrical field up to that far off your body. And all of your systems in your body communicate through your electromagnetic field, whether it's your fascial plane, your acupuncture channels, your heart, your brain, your muscles, sending acupuncture, your nerves, sending action potentials to your muscles. So James Oshman, I introduced you to a little bit earlier this evening, uh, wrote a tremendous number of books, but Energy, Medicine, and Therapeutics in Human Performance is one that's just fascinating. And he says, electrical magnetic fields, as well as light and sound, affect cellular processes and can be used to stimulate healing in various tissues. <clears throat> Integrative medicine is when we combine all of these medicines together, traditional allop allopathic or old-fashioned medicine with complementary alternative holistic medicine, all together. That's integrative. Let's put it all together, not just separate everything into parts. Western medicine is great at separating things into parts. Eastern medicine is great at synthesizing. Let's put the two together. So Dr. Robert Becker has also looked at the bioelectric fields and showed a lot of electrical currents related to tissue injury and how we could support rebuilding of tissue as a result of electrical currents. So subtle energy therapies such as therapeutic touch and Reiki could support those healing processes. And there's tremendous research, especially done years ago, even 60s, 70s, 80s, to the 90s on therapeutic touch. And I looked more recently where they're using different names for the same things. And they might be studying more Reiki now, but it's really interacting with the body in a way to promote healing using what we call subtle energy. 
So if you look at Lynn McTaggart's book, The Field, you could probably pick it up in your library. And you could also see a lot of interesting work done on the electromagnetic field and how the biofield, as it's called, affects things locally as well as distance, at a distance, like globally. And she has something called the intention experiment, which you go ahead and see this online if you like, it's all free. And she's shown after interviewing Nobel laureates and scientists around the world that your intention, what you think, does affect what's around you and it can affect life forms. You can check this out for yourself on that website. A little quote from Helen Keller, although the world is full of suffering, it's also full of the overcoming of it. Now we mentioned the electromagnetic field of the heart. Everyone knows you have an EKG, an electrocardiogram. Well, this magnetic field of your heart actually extends several feet out of your body. You could look at the Institute of Heart Math, M-A-T-H, you got a nice link there at the bottom of the page, and they've actually measured this field, which is even stronger than the field of your brain, which as you know, is easily measured by EEGs, electroencephalograms. So your heart's activity affects many things, mental clarity, creativity, emotional balance, intuition, and personal effectiveness. This is a quote from HeartMath. There are a tremendous group of scientific researchers that are doing studies about how their heart rate variability and emotion relate to even things such as worldwide events. Our and others research indicates that the heart's far more than a simple pump. It is in fact a highly complex information processing center with its own functional brain, commonly called the heart brain. Have you guys heard of the visceral brain, right? The visceral brain, that's the latest thing too. The gut is now considered its own brain. So the heart brain communicates and influences the cranial brain by the nervous system, hormonal system, and other pathways. These influence brain function and most of the body's major organs play an important role in mental and emotional experience and the quality of our lives. And you'll see it relates also to people's perception of pain. So to tune into your heart, <clears throat> these people have demonstrated that sustained positive emotions give rise to distinct mode of functioning, which we call psychophysiological coherence. So coherence. Heart rhythms, looking at heart rate variability, heart rhythms exhibit a sine-like pattern, and the heart's electromagnetic field becomes correspondingly more organized. At the physiological level, it's characterized by increased efficiency and harmony in the activity and interactions in the body system. So when there's greater heart coherence, the whole body functions better. All the organs, not just the heart. So in the state of different emotions, they've measured heart rate variability over time and look to see what is the difference? Well, when you're in a more coherent state, say a state of feeling of appreciation or gratitude versus a feeling of anger, look at the difference in the level of coherence as shown by the graph. So your heart and brain are entrained together. Your emotional states get encoded into the heart's electromagnetic field. This goes along with Candace Pert's talk about the neuropeptides of emotion being mediated also by the heart. And you can measure this field off the body. And that, that shows that there is a potential of subtle energetic communication between people even when they can't see it, right? Think about those mood rings you talked about before. Those are biofeedback devices. How can you tune into that? Well, you can tune into your heart coherence by looking at heart rate variability and look at that as a measure of stress, tension, and pain. You could look at your skin temperature as a measure of stress and anxiety. And if you use patients, you know, patients get like a mood ring, or I, I use little cards that have bio dots on them, little mood ring dots on the card, and the patient can just practice putting their thumb on the card before and after doing a mindfulness meditation or a deep breathing exercise or any of the other interventions I do, and they can see a difference in their skin temperature. Warmer, less stress, cooler, higher stress. Help them lower their stress, lowers their pain. So you can play with this little lab on your own. You know, try taking your pulse, take it for 10 seconds, multiply by six. So look to see what is your heart rate. <clears throat> and then try different things to see how your thinking affects your physiology. You could try it right now. Take your pulse, a couple seconds, see what it is. Now take a minute to think of a really difficult day. Maybe it was the day you were taking your boards. 
Maybe it's a day you're really angry about something. What did you feel? Try getting one of those mood rings or just go back and take your pulse after thinking about something that was somewhat distressing. Take your pulse and see, did it get any change? Typically the pulse rate goes up when you start thinking about something challenging. Now, if you're doing that for just a couple seconds, it'll take a little bit longer for that pulse rate to go up, but you'd be surprised. It's a little exercise you could do for yourself and you could use it to train your patients. They could be thinking about when they had horrific pain, look at what that does to their pulse, versus thinking about a time when they felt really, really good, really comfortable, really happy. Go back to that happy time in your mind. It will alter the pulse, the blood pressure, the respiratory rate in many instances. And it's a fun experiment to try. I do recommend, if you do that kind of experiment, always leave off on a positive note and thinking about something happy, right? Something comfortable. <clears throat> so you could think about a little practice for improving your heart coherence. And this, again, look at the Institute of Heart Math to learn more about it. And this will show that if you think about something you're really grateful for, so bring up that feeling of gratitude and appreciation. Really focus, not, not just remembering that time or that incidence or what happened, but really feel and practice feeling the sensation, the emotion of the gratitude and appreciation. Really focus on that. As you focus on the sense of appreciation, it actually alters your heart rate variability and makes everything more harmonious, makes everything more coherent. So you can change your state, whether it's a state of being in pain, or a state of being upset, whatever state it is, you could change that state by bringing in appreciation. So using one of those biofeedback cards or mood rings could be very helpful. There are skin temperature devices that you can purchase, biofeedback for your clinic, and play with some of these things as well. It's a lot of fun, and you'll be amazed at what you learn. Little quote from Albert Einstein, the significant problems we have cannot be solved at the same level of thinking with which we created them. So if you want to release somebody's pain, you got to get them to stop thinking about it. You need to have a focus on something else. Perception really is a meaningful thing. If you ever see any of those pictures, I'm sure you've seen them in the psychological literature, it's a picture and look at it one way, it looks like an old lady, you look at it from another dimension, it looks like a young lady. Well, same thing, what do you perceive? If you looked at this picture really quickly that I took when I was out walking, hiking in the woods, when I first looked, it looked like just another stone. And then the moth moved. And what did I notice? Ah, oh, it has a good camouflage, but my perception is really based in my attention. Right? There's something to think about. So you want to look at the latest research on energy and creative medicine and healing. There's a great link for you. Take a look. So think about maintenance. How do you maintain your energy? You know, so many people say, oh, I'm getting tired, I'm getting irritable, I need to take a nap. And naps are great for pain too, aren't they? Let your body regenerate, let everything calm down. I highly recommend the famous siesta. <laughs> we need to bring that back. So explaining to patients, you know, have you maintained your car recently? Did you get your oil changed? What happens if you don't change your oil? Right. It gets thick and gunky and things just don't move well in that engine. Well, when you're not moving, you're not changing your oil in your body, right? Movement is life. Movement is lubrication. Your synovial fluid, your joints actually produce a lubricating fluid, synovial fluid, from moving. So when you're in pain, you're afraid to move, you're not moving, you're just making things worse. So are you maintaining your body, whether it's through movement? Are you maintaining your mind, your spirit? How are you maintaining your emotions? What about your energy field? Now there's very interesting uh, practices that go back for centuries, well documented. If you look at some of the work of the leading anthropologists at leading uh, colleges like Berkeley, people like Michael Horner and other anthropologists really studied, went to live with traditional indigenous people all across the world to see what kind of practices do these people have and what do they share in common? And they found that a lot of the so-called medicine people, medicine men, medicine women, shared some of the basic, same ancient healing practices. And this is without the benefit of modern medicine. And some of these people who were called the people who know were called shamans. And they engaged in these various contemplative practices or meditative practices 
in which they had an altered state of consciousness. And they use that to access knowledge or what they call power, energy, to solve problems. And they found that this is across all different traditions. Well, they started working with some of these people who do this so-called shamanic journeying or practice, and they found on brain EEGs that when using some of the traditional practice, such as monotonous drumming, the movement and dance that you might see in some of those interesting shows in the movies, there's an activity shift from the anterior prefrontal area, the left analytical brain, to the posterior somatosensory experiential right brain. So actually there's changes in brain waves as a result of doing some of these practices, whether it's through dance, through dumb, drumming, fasting, you know, walkabouts, very interesting stuff. So these imaging studies do show that a general, you know, real neurological process is going on when people go into that so-called journeying or dreamy state that's associated with shamanic practice. So journeying, which some cultures call dreaming, some cultures call shamanic practice, Everybody calls it something different, but it's similar. They decided, let's do a study with the veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorder. And if we use some of these traditional practices of journeying, going into that altered state, somewhat like a trance state, and see, can we develop a protocol that can help these veterans with PTSD? And they found so far with the case series that there is a protocol that's effective, and they're using that to look at future research to help people heal, especially with post-traumatic stress disorder. So some promising research is being done. Now, one of the leaders in this area, Michael Horner, anthropologist, who did just pass away this past year, um, he's published practices of cultures around the world and how they use altered states to help people heal. And they described a lot of it, whether it's for pain relief, healing, you know, they talk about connecting with spirits or angels or animals or plants, just connecting with some other source. And that's a spiritual practice. Those sources were considered physicians to them or helpers or healers. And they're researching how this journeying or practice of altered state of mind can help people to gain information to help them heal and ease pain and also to gather information. So uh, Melanie Warner, there's a little quote from her saying, since embarking on this journey, I've learned that this is what alternative medicine does for people. By making us feel supportive, by summoning the power of expectations and belief, by relaxing our bodies and reducing stress, mind-body therapies move molecules in our brains in a way that can reduce the ills we feel in our bodies. That powerful stuff. So how important is it for people to connect? When someone's in pain, do they feel better connecting with others or would they rather be alone? Well, doesn't it often matter what those others are doing? Are they being supportive to help them when they're in pain or are they being dismissive? What's the response of the people around? Very, very important. Let's take a look at some of the other spiritual practices for managing pain. And that would be Reiki. You probably heard of Reiki and National Institute of Health has uh, promoted studies on this. They'd say it's basically a complementary health approach in which practitioners place their hands lightly on or just above a person. It could be near a person and not necessarily touching them. And their goal is to direct energy and healing to help facilitate that person's own healing response. And that's, again, based on the concept of energy medicine. Uh, the studies are showing promise of Reiki benefits for pain, especially for anxiety, for sleep. Uh, they did a nice uh, systematic review of 13 studies and eight out of 13 showed beneficial effects being stronger than placebo. And you know what, placebo has potent effects as well, doesn't it? Lots of studies on that. Another systematic review showed uh, more effects in randomized clinical trials for Reiki on pain and anxiety. So that's something to take a look at. For people especially that you can't touch, this is something using an energy medicine intervention that someone's either touching lightly on a patient's body or near the patient's body, not even touching them. So no negative side effects are ever documented to our knowledge and also mentioned by the National Institute of Health for Reiki. So of course we need more studies to look at that, but interesting stuff. So be patient and tough. Someday this pain will be useful to you, according to Ovid. You never know. So very much aligned with Reiki is something called therapeutic touch. And this Dr. Dolores Krieger, who is a uh, doctor level nurse, 
at NYU Medical Center in New York City, and Dora Coons put together a practice of moving their hands over the patient's bodies, not necessarily physically touching them. And it's, again, working on the energy field or biofield of the body. And uh, it's been recognized by the National Center of Complementary and Alternative Medicine, part of the National Institute of Health. Again, there are no risks to this, so there's no downside. And it has been shown to be useful in multiple studies for pain, cardiovascular disease, terminal illness, wound care. Uh, I studied and trained with Dr. Krieger years ago, and I took her courses on therapeutic touch when I was a new therapist. I thought it was fascinating because the same practices, the same hand positions that are used for therapeutic touch are the same hand positions in many cases that's used for Reiki, that's used for balancing the transverse fascial planes of the body, that's used in yoga, that's used in a lot of the Asian bodywork techniques, and it's typically in the areas of some of your major autonomic nerve plexus in the body. So I thought that the correlation was just remarkable because I have trained in both therapeutic touch as well as Reiki, as a Reiki master and an instructor. They replicated Dr. Krieger's studies over 100 times around the world and found that in response to therapeutic touch, people's hematocrit and hemoglobin was elevated after therapeutic touch. And that was done in people with coma, neonates, people who are fully awake and oriented times three, all different kinds of populations. So what's our main energy molecule in the body? Hemoglobin and hematocrit, right? Hemoglobin, so that's been raised. So there is an influence on energy. I'd love to see more of that work done. Have seen some very nice responses for people. The positive effects are for people with cancer, on their pain, on their ability to walk, and of course, you know, what's one of the main determinants of mortality? Gait speed, so impact on pain and walking. Better sleep scores in cancer patients compared to both control and placebo. And these are randomized clinical trials, so great stuff. Good correspondence between multicultural methods, as I said before, like the seven chakras of Asian body work, of yoga, Indian medicine, biofield therapy, you're talking about the crown, the pineal gland, hypothalamus, the thymus, the heart, the solar plexus, the sacral plexus, and the coccyx. So all related to these same fascial planes that we work on. Interesting correlation, and I'd love to see more of that study. <clears throat> and this is an interesting study from The Lancet. Uh, it's just out recently, and it's a quote, the avoidance of touch is bad medicine. I am as enthralled as anyone else by new medical technologies. This is written by a medical physician. I honor and indeed now depend upon the discovery of new medicines to manage previously untreatable conditions. I admire the achievements of doctors in an ever more pressured clinical environment. But a clinical examination is not only about eliciting evidence to piece together a differential diagnosis. And he goes on to say, touch builds trust, reassurance, and a sense of communion. Touch is about fostering. So I didn't get that to switch. A social bond of sympathy, compassion, and tenderness between two strangers. Touch can even convey the idea of survival. How many of us have the time to touch patients these days? I actually met with a physical therapist from a different office. Uh, this wasn't even just recently, but I, I was meeting with him about possibly referring patients. There's certain insurances that that particular office accepted, that our office didn't accept, and vice versa. We thought, well, how could we collaborate? He said, oh, we don't touch our patients. I almost fell out of the chair. I said, what do you mean you don't touch your patients? We don't have time to touch people. We just do exercise. So I thought it was fascinating. And that was a physical therapy office. So more on the importance of touch. And as you know, the Lancet is a major medical peer reviewed journal worldwide. Quote, underestimation of the importance of touch denies the universal need for physical, physical connection in human relationships of whatever kind. Touch expressed through the physical examination communicates comfort and concern. Touch encourages cooperation. It's time to bring touch back to, into medicine. Fascinating. That's from an MD who went through the system and realized, you know what, everybody's so busy typing in their computers, nobody's even touching, measuring, nobody's taking a pulse, it's all mechanized. Interesting. They did a systematic review of complementary and alternative medicines, 32 randomized clinical trials. And they looked at people with critical illnesses who receive Reiki, music, healing touch, therapeutic touch, aromatherapies, you know, using those beautiful smelling essential oils, light therapy, and reflexology. And they found overall no adverse effects 
there was a high risk of randomization bias in 50% of studies, and how many of us have seen that in other studies as well? But statistically significant improvements in pain using nature sounds and music. So how many of you have some beautiful things? Get us apps for all of this. Many of them are free. Agitation is relieved by reflexology. That's those using those pressure points at the bottom of the foot and nature sounds. Sleep is improved by reflexology music and nature sounds. Anxiety improved by aromatherapy, massage, reflexology, music and nature sounds. Arousal level is improved by massage and music. And mechanical ventilation time, how interesting is that, is actually improved by reflexology, that, that specialized massage of the feet, as well as music. Isn't it great to see that you can actually get people off a ventilator sooner using something as simple as reflexology and music? And I read that study, uh, that was mind boggling for me, even for me. But what about having a good laugh, right? Norman Cousins was, was famous for this. And uh, it's always something when you think, I always feel better when my doctor says something is normal for my age. But then I think, well, dying will also be normal for my age at some point, right? And uh, what's the difference between God and a doctor? God knows she's not a doctor. You got to have a few laughs. I once heard a joke about amnesia, but I forgot how it goes. So laughter produces that runner's high. Those endogenous opiates come out to help people to feel better. So these are natural painkillers. Why not incorporate some of this into the practice, right? Learn a few good jokes. I never was that good at telling a joke, but I can find them online, as you can see. Jim Carrey, the famous actor, my focus is to forget the pain of life. Forget the pain, mock the pain, reduce it, and laugh. Laughter improves pain tolerance. They did studies at Oxford, experimental studies, looking at people saying, well, let's give them either a stage show or a funny movie. Laughter improved the pain threshold in the experimental groups compared to the controls. And people didn't have to take as much endorphin medicated pain, right? Endorphins come out, lower the pain response. Natural endorphins in your body. LaPierre looked at a randomized clinical trial looking at people who watch a half hour of a comedy video versus a boring documentary. So subjects were given delayed onset muscle soreness. So they did a whole bunch of exercise to make one leg sore. And then they in inflicted pain using a blunt force and used a pain scale to check it out. The people who were watching the comedy video, okay, their affect, their emotion related to the pain improved. But interestingly, the boring video decreased pain tolerance. So don't put on any boring TV shows when your patients are around, right? Show them to do something different. Laughter is the tonic, the relief, the surcease for pain, according to Charlie Chaplin. So take a deep breath. Teach your patients to breathe. Teach them not to take themselves quite so seriously. Teach them about the pain. And when they ask you things like, does an apple a day really keep the doctor away? You simply have to tell them, only if you aim at it well enough, right? And what's the difference between a general practitioner and a specialist? Aha, one treats what you have, the other thinks you have what he treats, right? So good stuff, laughter is good stuff. So there's some interesting challenges with spiritual medicine, energy medicine, and uh, most of them are epistemological challenges. And that's that the dependent independent variables assume the influences are localized, real time and explicitly sourced. And they're really not real time. They could be extended over time. And they're not necessarily local. They could be non-local. So None of these assumptions may hold true for DHI phenomena. Defining the when and where of intentional effects in their actual source can be exceedingly difficult because anyone involved in one of the experiments is unavoidably entangled with the healing process. So a couple things on the Q&A just going to uh, go to. I see uh, Chris is saying not in uh, a lot of, in. Uh, I'm trying to read the questions here, but they're kind of disappearing. So give me a second to see if I could bring those questions back up for you. I got out of the breathe slide. There we go. So a lot of integrative medicine approaches. Okay, what well, someone's asking a lot, I can't see the question. A lot of integrative medicine approaches is something we can't do with patients during PT sessions. 
Uh, it depends upon which approaches. There are many things here that I use in PT sessions with patients. I often use the dialogue of hypnosis to help them to relax and quiet. I use massage. I use so I use music. Um, uh, Kristen says you're not sure how to teach this to the patients. Well, look up the pain neuroscience education. There's a whole description of how to teach that to your patients. Uh, also wants to know if you're not a music or art therapist, how do you incorporate into a PT session? When you want to incorporate these, we're just touching on these in today's little webinar, go online and start to learn more about this. I went back to learn more about music. I went back and started reading to learn more about how I could use things. Um, and I notice that you feel you can't use these interventions on a regular basis. I've used them on a regular basis with my patients for over 30 years. And is it billable? You're using these in combination with what you're doing. Pain neuroscience education and teaching patients about pain and how the body processes pain is billable. That is a therapeutic activity. It's a functional activity. I wouldn't say that you can bill for something like therapeutic touch. And do you feel like you need additional training for many of these? Yes, you do. So absolutely, we're just teaching you what you can learn more about, but you could use the relaxation, you could use the pain neuroscience, uh, you can use the relaxation therapy. Okay, very, very important. Uh, Stephanie wants to know, with therapeutic touch for your replacement for those who feel Reiki is contradictory to their religion? Uh, they are very similar. Uh, you might want to try that as well. Uh, it really has nothing to do with religion. Okay, I'm seeing someone says they love their clinic because they only do one-on-one -on -one treatments and the questions completely disappeared. So I'm gonna have to come back to them. Okay, sorry about that. So some issues of studying spiritual approaches is we need to be able to do more in our research. And it's often hard to localize those issues. But can we ask better questions? So how do we use a complementary approach to facilitate a shift in perceptions on the part of people in pain? And we could do this right in the clinic. You don't need a whole lot of extra education to do this. We can ask patients better questions, knowing what we discussed earlier about how we can change people's perceptions of their pain, similar to what we do with cognitive behavioral therapy. You don't have to go back and train in that whole thing, but you could use some of the concepts already. So some things that you could use already here would be empowering questions that alter pain processing. Ask your patients, how does your pain serve you? What has your pain taught you? What's great about the pain? Because most people are busy running away from the pain and not dealing with it. And by doing so, they're not moving, they're not functioning, they're stopping doing things. So bringing them to a different resource, a different concept of the pain is very, very important. So applying that immediately, applying the relaxation, concept and the breathing immediately. Applying teaching them about neuroscience can immediately change their pain. So these are things that you could use right away. So they say with spiritual balance, you're able to deal with whatever life brings you and know you're okay. You're able to find meaning and purpose, even in situations that are painful and not to your liking. So an example of using this tomorrow with a patient is teach them breathing exercise. Teach them that things like Tai Chi or yoga or meditation can be helpful. Is it an extra intervention? Yes, it's something you're teaching a patient to do. If you don't know Tai Chi or yoga or mindfulness meditation, you can always learn about it. It's not difficult. I used some simple Tai Chi movements with patients all the time that were the very first movements I learned when I took Tai Chi in school. I've taught those movements in numerous courses and therapists have gone out to share them with patients to help their balance, help their relaxation and help their pain. So sometimes it means you have to learn a little bit more right away and it gives you an idea if there's other things to do. What about other questions we can ask to change what pain means to people? How can you use your experience of pain to help yourself and others? These are things you could do immediately. There's so many people feeling like, oh, you know, I'm in pain and this is horrible. I can't do anything about it. Well, can you share what you've done? What's helped you? deal with your pain? How can you help someone else? How can you teach them what to do? So I learned when I had pain uh, post-surgically that going into just doing some breathing exercise, 
having that detached focus that we spoke of, which is the definition of mindfulness. I could share that with the patient in a matter of a couple of minutes while I'm helping them to get some mobilization. I could be teaching them how to do breathing exercise and to be mindful of their pain, to lower their pain. I could be asking them questions like, how can you use this experience of your pain to help yourself and others? Well, I learned from my pain that if I don't take breaks in my work, I'm gonna have more pain and more tennis elbow and really wear out my hands. So I learned to pace myself and I learned not to hurt myself by overworking. So that may be an answer a patient gives when you ask them, how can you use your experience of pain to help others? Well, I could teach others not to overdo it and to know, you know, there's, you have to stop sometime. I've worked with some of my athletes, my dancers said, you know, you really overdid it and you have tremendous pain now as a result of overdoing it. How can you use that to help others? Well, I can teach the other dancers that, you know, if they hurt themselves, they don't have to just keep dancing and worrying about being in the next show. They could take more care of themselves. So there's things that they could do. In what ways has pain made you who you are now? All right, so that may have helped someone. I had patients who had tremendous chronic pain. One of my professional dancers who fell off a stage had tremendous chronic pain. And she was in tears. She wasn't able to work. She was disabled by it. She ended up going back after working with her for a period of time and using some of these very concepts along with traditional physical therapy. She went back to become a therapist. She decided, okay, it was okay to move away from the dance that she loved so much. And she went back and took all the things she learned about pain to help people in pain by becoming a therapist. So there can be a positive side to the pain experience. Having a different attitude towards it changes the pain. So the secret of success is learning how to use pain and pleasure instead of pain and pleasure using you. If you do that, you're in control of your life. Life doesn't control you. So it's getting this concept. Clinician nonverbal communication. This is something you could apply immediately. You just simply have to pay attention. Ruben showed the effect of nonverbal communication on pain. Have you ever noticed, you ever go to the doctor's office, you walk in and they're like completely detached from you. They're typing on the computer, asking you, you know, oh, false blood pressure. Well, the main complaint was taken by somebody else, a nursing assistant, when you went in the office. The doctor basically reads the thing, says, okay, you know, two or three sentences, gives you a prescription for something and walks out. But what did you notice in the nonverbal communication? They didn't look you in the eye. They didn't smile. They didn't stop to acknowledge what you had to say. How does that make you feel? How many of you have had this experience in today's medical world? So that nonverbal communication of the clinician is key. Here they did a randomized clinical trial and they did, you know, had a tape physician demonstrating either very supportive nonverbal behaviors or non-supportive behaviors. And they found, interestingly, it was a big difference between gender. You know, males and females. Pain ratings were reduced by a high level of support in men. And interestingly, pain ratings were increased when a high level of support was given to women. Fascinating how different genders perceive of nonverbal behaviors. So they said nonverbal behaviors absolutely influence pain perception. So take care of your facial expressions, take care of your movements, take care of your attitude when you're dealing with people in pain. And I've seen this even in some student I've watched in clinical affiliations. I've seen it in employees where, you know, someone is just disgusted that they're like, oh, here comes that pain patient. All she does is crab. She goes, does nothing but complain. She sucks the life out of me. And the therapist goes in with a really bad attitude about that patient. How's that person going to feel when the therapist is going in with that kind of attitude versus Another therapist in the office, wow, you know, I know this lady's really having a lot of trouble. She complains a lot. Let me see what I can do to help her today. Totally different attitude. And that affects the patient. So that is something that you can control immediately, your nonverbal behavioral effect. Here's a systematic review looking at three main factors that alter pain perception. Sex, status, and nonverbal behavior. So, and it is an additive value. Uh, expectations, negative emotions, stress and changes in amplitudes of placebo or nocebo effects. So what matters? Here's what you could use, eye contact and strong voice, keeping a good strong voice, not muffled, not down low, blah, 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 mumbling, but a strong voice with smiling, using gestures, leaning toward the patient, you know, to show them you're listening. And from your own perspective, having high confidence, professionalism, and competence reduces pain scores and raises placebo effects. And these have been shown in randomized clinical trials. These are things you could do immediately. 
So more research is needed to understand the mechanism of action of how these integrative medicines work. We need to know more about the benefits and risks, although the risks of these, most of these are extremely minimal or nothing. Uh, and clinical practice guidelines. Today, everything's about clinical practice guidelines for how you treat the neck or the back or the pain. So we need to have more clinical practice guidelines for these different conditions. Here's a systematic review looking at con complementary and alternative uh, medicine, looking at over a thousand articles, including supplements, herbs, mind-body techniques, like a lot of things we talked about here. Acupuncture, Qigong is kind of like Tai Chi with breathing and energy. Healing touch we talked about, laying on of hands, osteopathy, homeopathy, hyperthermia, orthomolecular therapy, laser neural therapy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So looking at all these different types of therapies in a systematic review, what's the difference? What did they find? Well, for breast cancer, significant effects on improving quality of life in patients for the complementary medicines. And overall, they found that, you know, mostly these people are using acupuncture and yoga. These are things you could learn more about. You don't have to necessarily learn acupuncture and become an acupuncturist. Learn some acupressure. There's courses online about it. There's books you could get about it. It's not something that you have to, you know, go on, go to school for years and years to learn a little bit about it, learn a little bit about yoga. It's helpful. Mind-body intervention showed more improvement in quality of life than other techniques. That's exactly what we talked about today. Very important. We do need more randomized clinical trials, of course, in any of these. So they want better randomized clinical trials and they want us to be able to come up with some protocols. So if you would like to do some research, this is a great area that's ripe. Health and Human Services is often giving out grants, look to see what's out there, and it may be something that you could contribute. So patient self-management, okay, if they're identifying themselves as a pain patient, teach them how neuroscience matters. Teach them how to look at their body differently. Teach them to be able to be more resilient and cope, doing things to help their pain, like applying ice when it hurts, doing some relaxation breathing, teaching them how to take more frequent work breaks, teaching them how to use taping or bracing when needed, right? These kinds of things. Teaching them how to experience the pain differently, right? It's a great deal of pain in life, but the only pain that can be avoided is the pain that comes from trying to avoid pain. So polling question number six. In a randomized clinical trial, clinician nonverbal behaviors are shown to have a significant impact on patient pain. Okay, what nonverbal behaviors showed a positive impact on pain people perceive? Using eye contact and a st strong voice and smiling, using gestures, leaning toward patients, having higher confidence, professionalism, and competence, all of the above. All of the above. So this is something you can apply the minute you go back to work tomorrow. Think about that. So how to for pain management, build coping skills for patients, help them to focus away and be more mindful, to not be so critical and judgmental about the pain, but to understand that it's, especially with chronic pain, it's really a function of the nervous system and the brain, and that they can retrain the brain to help to ease some of their sensation of pain. There needs to be a willingness to change thought processes, not just on the part of the patient, but on the part of the clinician. Challenging or limiting beliefs to create a better outcome. No one has an instant pill to just make all the pain go away. Okay, so we have to snap out of it. No one could just say you could fix everything the day you go back to your clinic tomorrow. But you can help people to manage pain better so they have a better quality of life. And you can do that tomorrow using some of what we talked about here. Learn more. It's not the events of our lives that shape us, but our beliefs as to what those events mean. So help your patients focus on abilities instead of disabilities. When they come in, direct your conversation. Okay, yeah, I know you couldn't walk that half mile you used to walk, but wow, you're able to walk a quarter mile today. That is fabulous. Focus on that. Don't focus on, oh yeah, you have a herniated disc. That's what's causing all your pain. So you really can't work. You focus on, okay, you have a herniated disc. Let's see what we can get you to do. Let's see what we can help you with. So use your relaxation techniques to ease the tension and distract the brain. Use laughter, use comedy, teach patients, you know, pick a funny TV show, pick some calming, quiet, meditative music. It will help the pain. Uh, I've read in other studies, especially classical music is very, very helpful for that. I often tell patients, pick some music without lyrics that's your favorite that's relaxing for you. Keep your goals realistic. 
you know, many times people feel like, oh, you give me 20 different exercises. There's all these things I have to do. Chunk it down into small pieces. So they need to do it one day at a time. You want to keep your goals very realistic. And of course, let patients know, look, you have a right to say no. You have a right to ask questions. You have a right to make mistakes. That's fine. You're changing your focus. Teach patients that when the, the pain is calling their attention to bring their attention away from the pain. Call it, you know, when you're getting that pain, you'll call up your best friend and have a conversation. Go into the other room and pick up your favorite book and read a few lines out of your favorite book. Pick up that joke book we talked about or go online and start looking at some funny memes or jokes online. You know, do something to change the focus. Go ahead and do a little drumming. You love to do some drumming or play some guitar, so, so go do some of that. Whatever it is that they can do, look out the window and see how beautiful the trees are just to change the focus away from the pain. Be able to teach patients that they can talk about their feelings of pain without being criticized. And they can learn how to move their body in ways that will relieve the tension and the pain. And that's up to you to learn really all of those movement therapies that can be helpful. Get busy with activities that bring joy, laughter, and fulfillment. And especially rethink how you feel about pain, how you approach pain. You can be healthy and active despite having chronic pain. Dr. Bernie Siegel, who is a very uh, famous for uh, love medicine and miracles, say, if doctors are trained in communication skills and quackery would diminish greatly. We need to reparent our patients so that they feel loved and cared for and are in turn able to love and care for themselves. When you're told, what day you're going to die and all hope is taken away, why not seek alternative therapies? <clears throat> so there's the essence of it all. When you have transformation of the butterfly and the creation of a life of harmony and order, the rainbow, when you love your life and body, then amazing things happen. When medicine incorporates these things into truly caring for patients, which I think is one of the first things you could really do for people, quackery will cease and medicine will expand its horizons. I haven't been able to persuade them yet, but I'd love to see the American College of Surgery change its pledge from I will deal with my patients to I will care for my patients. So it's a lot of change of attitude. So how will you approach, take out a piece of paper and write down now, are there three changes that you can make to your plan of care to help people in pain? Write down and see if there's three things you can do differently to help people in pain based on what you learned here. And you have three hours worth of information. You could go back and review it to see some of the interventions you could go ahead and learn right away. And some of these you'll have to go back now, at least you know what to go back for based on the literature. And if you've gone through pain, think about what you've done to help yourself. And then what can you go back to learning and sharing with others that was helpful for them. The one word frees up of all the weight and pain of life, that word is love. That's from Sophocles, that's an old one, but a good one. And if you'd like to share your ideas about pain and if there's something more that you would like to see incorporated with something like this, go ahead and share that with me on the Facebook page or the website. And if you want some interesting videos or other information about any of these topics, feel free to let me know but it's really about focusing on what people can do and focusing away from what they can't do. You also have additional references here. So we touched on many things and it's really up to you to be in a situation of lifelong learning as a professional, learn more. I've given you some directions about where to go and you could find in the references, lots of information about how these work. You have the internet, go back and learn and look to see if there's something that interests you, like learning about Reiki or learning about biofeedback. You can certainly use biofeedback in your practice. Get the biofeedback equipment. It's not difficult to learn. And focus on what you can do to help people. Go to the Health and Human Services website, National Institute of Health website, and you can see a lot of the interesting complementary and alternative medicine for pain that's up and coming. And if you have questions or if I can help you with any more resources, please feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to help you. And I hope I've given you some sense of direction on what can, you can use to help people with pain. So I wanted to thank you for your help tonight. And thank you for your time and really caring about what you can do for people in pain. And uh, thanks again to the sponsorship of this program. 
Have a good evening.